Ladies and gentlemen, it's Tuesday, the 15th day of November 2016. I'm your host, Alex Jones. We're going to be here for the next four hours. We've got some big guests lined up as well today. But first, wow. There were not one, not two, but three different articles in the New York Times yesterday basically saying that I'm a conspiracy theorist and that globalism doesn't even exist. Not to mention world government or corporate world government, but that globalism is made up in my mind. And the New York Times said it, so it must be true. And Stephen Bannon is insane, uh, the new head of the White House under Trump, the guy that plots the course. Everybody else that I guess steers it. This is a new level of over-the-top brainwashing. Meanwhile, Business Insider, Obama on Trump's election. We have to guard against a rise in a crude sort of nationalism. So nationalism bad, global government good, but doesn't exist, just like death panels on Obamacare. This is the mind control. So I thought today we'd go back and pull several dozen clips of world leaders calling globalism a move to world government and global governance. We're going to have the definitions on screen for TV viewers, for radio listeners. We're going to read them on air and we're going to have a little study time, kind of like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood for the New York Times and scores of other publications. But if you wanted to know their response to this route of globalism... They're going to announce we're all insane racist and it doesn't exist. So if you don't want foreign corporations ruling your life, you're a racist. Now, uh, here they are attacking Trump saying we're all racist. Here it is. Nor, he said, had he heard, he heard about reports of racial slurs and personal threats against African Americans, Latinos and gays by some of his supporters. I'm very surprised to hear that. I, would, I, I hate to hear that. I mean, I hate but to you hear do it. hear it. I don't Media hear it. Lies. I, 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 saw, I saw one or two instances. On, on well, I think media? it's a very small amount. Again, I think it's Do you immediate. want to say anything to those I, people? I would say don't do it. That's terrible. Because I'm going to bring this country together. They're harassing Latinos, Muslims. I am so saddened. By the way, they put this video say, out. Stop it. But I want to take it and re-release it. If it helps. Right here over Trump. Showing it. the group of Mexican men beating up the white lady. This, this video isn't even hardcore enough. There will be because people have to die to make a change in this world. You fucking Trump! You fucking Trump! Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the America you want. He's attacked because he's white. He's a Trump supporter, but that's okay because he doesn't exist. This is the media trying to create a race war. Since you voted for Donald Trump, this is you mother of the year. Out. Imagine doing uh -oh. this to a child. It's okay. It's okay. It's this is the America you want. CD Baby made a claim against this video. And they're only seven seconds, nothing. It's nothing compared to all the ten seconds snips. And communism and idiocy and ignorance. Female student attacks sophomore Jade Armenia. This girl comes up to me and she said, "Do you hate Mexicans?" And I was like, "Not a hate crime. It's only a white person." You hate Mexicans. All this America is so racist. It's time for you to leave. How? Yeah. Trump. Cry baby. The pussy generation. Totally million people. Literal babies. Skank. He says, stop, by the way. All over the United States, here at UT, but, but all over the country, they're handing out Play-Doh and coloring books uh, and saying come in for counseling over the election to make the students even more mentally ill and deficient. Let's let's compare the liberty movement that we were just surveying there in that three-year-old promo where we basically lay out our Declaration of Independence Part 2 against the globalist to a cross-section that I played in the first segment of the people out protesting against the election of Donald J. Trump. A bunch of hysterical Arrested Development babies who over a hundred major universities that I have listed here in the last week 
have handed out coloring books, Play-Doh, and yes, I found several that are even giving them pacifiers. You have to understand, though, they're not joking. They want you to be arrested development, and the government is your mommy and your daddy. This is the plan. I've told you this for years, but they're not playing around. They're not playing games. Now in business, they're saying, don't even tell an employee that they're doing something wrong. That's a trigger. This is how you sabotage a country so you can't compete with China. Where people chain their children up by the millions every day on, at power poles and light poles outside the factories, work 16 hours on average, and then come out and have one meal a day in a shipping container and then crap directly into rivers. The government could produce plumbing for them. They could have them in nice housing. They have entire cities that are completely empty that the elites own that are just sitting there empty as they use the farmer population that they're forcing off the land as total slaves. And if you call for the Chinese to not be total slaves, you are supposedly anti-Chinese. It is so incredibly cold-blooded. But let's compare the liberty movement and, and folks at Trump rally to the dirty, ugly, stupid, lazy, disgusting, hateful, 300-pound toddlers. Here it is. <laughs> Stop this is, it. This is total mental illness. But this is done by design. Meanwhile, Megan Kelly is out in a big interview saying this is the year of the bully. Leftism, political correctness, everything about it is nothing but pure, absolute bullying. She acted like a horrible bully in those debates. She is a bully. She's misrepresented everything. DrudgeReport.com is linked to it. Exclusive Fox anchor Megan Kelly describes scary bullying year of the Trump. But going back to Drudge with the headline, it comes down to this. It's the year of her being full of bull. That has a double entendre because I have described, and others have, Trump as a bull. The man is a bull. I don't go off horoscopes, but, but the, they say there's something to it, I guess. I guess I'm an Aquarius, bring and change the world. But, but what, is, what is the sign of Trump? I don't even know that. Is he a bull? Because, I mean, the guy is the living embodiment of a bull. He goes to these big press dinners, dozens of them last year and a half, and they all laugh at him, call him names, call him ugly, say he's stupid. He just sits there proudly taking it. And I got to say, my kinship to Trump is this. When I know I'm right, you could have a billion people laughing at me, and it means nothing. It means nothing. It means zero. Because I know the truth, and I'm here trying to change their minds and actually lift them up. Okay, uh. Trump being elected has already paid off, and then it's discredited the mainstream media, discredited the pollsters, discredited the whole corrupt system, brought the idea of Americanism, not globalism, us running our own affairs back to the fore. And that said, here it is. He talked to Putin yesterday. There's basically a transcript of the discussion released by the Russians and the United States. It's uh, identical. DEFCON nuclear threat reduced to safest level following Donald Trump victory. It went from DEF condition or defense condition three back to five, and it was reportedly uh, secretly already at defense condition two. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's out of the express.co.uk. Meanwhile, Trump and Putin, we will destroy ISIS together. And he says he looks forward to working with Russia and the Russian people and having a great relationship. Trump and Putin vow to tackle ISIS together as they hold breakthrough talks after billionaire's election. So we're going to be getting into all that. Meanwhile, George Soros met with all of his cohorts uh, over the weekend in D.C. to figure out the new attack. And the answer came. Redouble all the standard efforts, race baiting, divide and conquer, flooding the borders, collapsing the nation. Everything they always do. So that's coming up. We're also going to uh, look at the latest attack on free speech they're now launching. Google, Facebook moved to, quote, restrict fake news and fake ads. Oh, really? Nine times out of ten, the fake ads I see in the fake news is from the Democratic Party and the Soros crowd. That's a Reuters story. Remember Amy Schumer? I just picked this on Sunday as a case point example. Put out a fake headline with a fake newspaper from the past with, with, with trimming around it, with yellowed paper to fool you. 
with Trump saying how dumb he thinks conservatives are and how much he hates you. She later at the bottom of the article, which she knows only 10% statistically would actually get down that far, that it's, quote, fake and isn't a real quote. So she can't be sued, she thinks. This is the essence of organized fraud. Oh, but don't worry. The very same group now that engaged in all this deception and that, and that allowed, you know, for years, kill Donald Trump Facebook pages with hundreds of thousands of likes, they're now going to restrict free speech they're announcing today. Uh, Twitter's announcing it as well. But let me get to the big news here. We've got one of the top experts in the world on global government joining us. William F. Jasper of the New American Magazine. I got interviewed by the New York Times yesterday, and in the last six months, they've called many times. I have not called them back, not because I'm being arrogant or powerful. I told the lady, I said, listen, I don't want to be used as a prop for you to then write some article acting like you're really a journalist. The New York Times is one of the most deceptive outfits out there, only behind the Washington Post. And I said, but I'll talk to you for 20 minutes, and I did. She didn't write an article that I saw, but three others got written. It sounded like she was in a beehive of talking people and, you know, typing. And she wanted to know about my conversation with Donald Trump on Friday. But then there's all these other articles. Just look at these. Yeah, and I'm not going to cover this because I'm in it. I'm going to cover this because it illustrates everything we're up against on every front, whether it's health care or sovereignty or taxes, the total wall of deception. Globalism, a far-right conspiracy theory buoyed by Trump. Now, globalism is the admitted planetary system being set up. Davos calls it globalism. The EU calls it globalism. State Department calls it globalism. That's the world system. So this is like saying Alex Jones has a theory that a thing called the Pacific Ocean exists, or Alex Jones has a theory that there's something called the continent of Australia. Alex Jones has a conspiracy theory that there's a species uh, of shark called Great White, or he has a, a theory that there is a uh, species called the you know Great Hammerhead. We're talking about things that exist. It's kind of like Gibbs, the, the Obama's former press secretary, said, "Listen, I was told years after the Predator Drone Kill program existed." Everybody knows it's real, all of the news, to come out and say it doesn't exist. And they all start laughing. Or, oh, if you like your doctor, you can keep it. Ha, 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 that was a good one. Tell them another one. They are still doing this, hoping they can con the public back into a trance and hoping or, or, or just never let the debate get to, hey, we don't want globalism. They just keep going, excuse me, don't know what that is. Don't compute. It's like a stonewalling. But that's, there are three articles in the, in the New York Times, but a whole bunch of others all over the media saying it doesn't exist. These aren't the droids you're looking for. Move along. And, oh, by the way, we're all racist. So that's all they've got. Like, we don't want to be under global government. Shut up, racist. It doesn't exist. We'll be back. Oh, look, it's out of Voca TV. The, the NSA wants to track with little chips everything drones that are sold in stores do just like all your cell phones since the 96 telecommunications act have tracker chips i told folks about it at the time it was actually in the congressional budget i had experts on but oh that's a conspiracy theory no such thing but now they can basically take over the drones and this is what the panopticon technocracy is about in mit's own words is everything wired into a global system they control. And in one New York Times article yesterday, where they again just say, I'm imagining all this, there's quotes where I say it's a global government calling itself a technocracy with digital embedded platform systems in all telecommunications, all appliances to track and trace and control everything we do. It is the ultimate form of slavery. And then they go, wow, the imagination of this guy. I'm quoting the Davos group. I'm quoting MIT. I'm quoting the NSA whistleblowers. I have the former technical head on every month. He's been in studio. We went out to dinner and there were literal spies following us. Oh, but the New York Times tells you it doesn't exist. And don't get into it. Don't look at it or we'll call you racist. Don't go over there. Don't say you don't want Obamacare. 
Everyone knows races are lying and saying it's not free. But here's the good news. It doesn't work anymore. Now, I said NSA, the way they pitch it is AT&T and NASA to build national drone tracking system. Oh, but as we go back, the telecommunications companies are basically run by the NSA and they hardwire the systems in. That all came out via Snowden. But that was already in the Telecommunications Act of 96. That's when it really went ubiquitous system-wide. The company wants to protect drones from hackers. Oh, thank God, with back doors in it. That's why it's also in the My News stack today from the Associated Press that, oh, back doors put in chips and cell phones by the government oh, over decades oh, oh, fell into the hands of the communist Chinese. Oh, like Hollywood's falling into the hands. Like the Panama Canal is falling into the hands. Like the defense industries are falling into the hands. Oh, it's falling into the hands. Wonder why? Because a global deal was made more than 30 years ago. And Donald Trump knows about it. He's trying to ally with Russia. They came out in the meeting with, and said, we're allying with Russia to stop China. And now the traitors in our government are flipping out. Going, he doesn't know what he's doing. You better back off. You better stop right now, Trump. Now, listen, you can do whatever you want, but you're not going to you're not going to not have a war with Russia. Is that understood right now? China's our friend. They've only got a military five times bigger than Russia's. They've only got bases everywhere. We only sold out to them, Trump. It was a great deal. We all get to sit on the boards of these big corporations with all those slaves over there now. Now, you don't try that, huh? Trump's like, I'm going to wake the American people up, just like Brexit in the UK and Europe. We're going to get out of this. No, you're not. We're going to say it doesn't exist. So next hour, I'm going to show clip after clip of world leaders saying global governance, global government, the TPP and NAFTA and GATA for global government, global governance, the definitions. So you'll have that video to send to people and say, world government's being set up and Trump's trying to block it. And that's why they're so pissed. But oh, look, here's Obama. Obama on Trump's election, we have to guard against a rise in a crude sort of nationalism. So he goes with an olive branch to Obama. He's nice. He goes with an olive branch to Congress and everybody else. And what's their response? They're all, including Republicans, stabbing him in the back 24-7. Lou Dobbs is right saying he cannot trust the ultimate weasel. And that, of course, is Paul Ryan and his baby, Galactic Weasel is his name. That's uh, Rince Priebus. But that's what's going on. And so meeting with world leaders, Obama warned today of the need to guard. We must guard against not the rise of the military industrial complex, not globalism, but no, no, no. The rise of nationalism, both at home and abroad, during a press conference in Greece, one week after the election of Donald Trump. Alongside Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tisperis, if I pronounced that right, who, of course, came in claiming he'd stop the takeover and then appointed a bunch of globalists in charge. So what they're doing is the same old deal. Demonizing nationalism, saying it's racist, saying it's evil, that you know, foreign banks can't come in and loot you like a third world country. But then meanwhile, populism takes over the world. Bloomberg, oh, the great threat. Noam Chomsky, the Republican Party has become the most dangerous organization in world history because they might actually have self-determination and not be under global fascism and the whole fake left that apologizes for it while claiming they're critical of it. Meanwhile, a Trump doctrine, America first. How, how horrible, but globalism doesn't exist. And here's our president just a few hours ago in Greece at a press conference telling us he's discovered the enemy, the big threat. And guess who it is? Not the multinational corporations, not the globalists that are openly announcing world government. No, no, no. It's nation states, which we keep telling people the globalists are here to shut down nation states and attacking nationalism. But simultaneously, that doesn't exist. But it does exist. And so here's the president telling us about the grave threat. I do believe, separate and apart from any particular election uh, or movement, that we are going to have to guard against a rise in a crude sort of nationalism or ethnic identity or tribalism that is built around an us and a them. And I will never apologize for saying that the future of humanity and the future of the world is gonna be defined by what we have in common 
as opposed to those things that separate us and ultimately lead us into conflict. Now, that's Radio Free Europe. That, uh, that's captured Europe by the OECD, by the multinational robber baron coalition that took over at the end of World War II. It's, it's declassified. That's who oversaw our elections and tried to steal them, but it failed. And there is the president knowing full well George Soros, and it's in the WikiLeaks, admit we're going to create racial divides. We're going to play groups off against each other. We're going to send groups of black people into Trump rallies to make it look like a race war. And so we should take the clip of, of uh, everything they say and then just put behind it the WikiLeaks and put behind it the clips of all these groups spewing racism and kill the cops and kill Whitey or you look like Trump because you're white. I'm going to beat you up. This is what's being pushed. And, and listen, that's a cue to listeners and viewers. You want to win this war, we're already beginning to win, but we're in the middle of the war right now. I don't have the crew to do this. I'm running back there during breaks, directing two or three editors. It was like five editors, but several have been working on other stuff to take these videos and start adding things to them because they go viral and millions of people see it and we just show the hypocrisy. But you've got to show them saying there's no global government and then show the very same people calling for global government. You've got to show Obama saying Obamacare will be free and then showing it's not free. You have to remind people because the general public has goldfish memories. But you can deprogram them. And it's starting to happen. But I need viewers and listeners when I make these cues on air. This is a war. This isn't a radio show or TV show. This is, this is an emergency transmission. It's why the military listens. It's why the police listen. It's why foreign governments listen. Because I address this as it is. A culture war with globalists taking over. We need a unified culture of truth and justice and due process in unity and free association and coming together. They're the ones creating a race-based culture and religion-divided culture in the broken strategy of balkanization known by British intelligence as the great game. Now, I'm giving you all terms you can go look up and learn about. Go study the British great game or divide and conquer under the Romans. And then you go to WikiLeaks and they use the terms divide and conquer to quote, keep us dumb. They go on and say, we're in deep trouble. They're not staying asleep. We're going to have to use demographic warfare. Demographic warfare is race war. So he's up there as a referee going, hey, whoa, whoa. If you oppose globalism, which doesn't exist according to the New York Times, if you want nationalism, then you basically are a racist. This is what they're selling, the idea that you've got to open your borders, everybody around the world, give them free stuff, or you're a racist. When all they're trying to do is conquer the sovereign countries. In fact, Obama gave a UN speech just a month ago where he said we've got to give up national sovereignty. Can we find that clip too? That Americans have to be ready to give up their sovereignty to an international group. Do I know you're finishing an edit in there of like four minutes of world leaders calling for global government, but I want to add at the beginning Obama's last speech of the UN. Just type into YouTube. It's uh, We have the clip. It's Obama says America must give up sovereignty. And he says, listen, it's tough for me at home. I got a, bun a, a bunch of backward scum, basically, and I'm there trying to sell them on global government. There it is. Obama tells the UN, giving up freedom enhances American security. And the date on that was, my, is my memory right, it was a month ago, it was September 20th. So it was more than a month ago. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Obama thinks U.S. sovereignty overrated should cede freedoms to UN. I am convinced that in the long run, giving up some freedom of action enhances our security. I mean, I mean listen, Ted Bundy would get 16-year-old girls in his yellow Volkswagen. He bought it because it was non-threatening. He'd wear little gray suits and act nerdly, but handsome and say, hey, I'd like to take you out for some ice cream in a movie. And they were young girls. He knew not to target older ones that were smart or, or worldly. And he'd get them in the car and he'd take them. And he'd say, listen, I got a gun. I'm going to blow your head off, bitch. But if you put these handcuffs on, I'm going to be real nice. And he's, listen, bitch, I'm going to call you a racist and blow your head off, okay, and send a SWAT team. This is what the media is doing. You don't put these freaking handcuffs on. She put the handcuffs on, he right in the nose. Good. You come with me. He hold her by the hair and drive her to his house with a basement. He took, he drive in that garage. He take her in there for a good two weeks of hardcore torture. That's what Obama just told you. Listen, you give up a little bit of freedom of action. You let me tie your arms and legs up. I'm going to take real good care of you. You understand me? There's no world government. We love you, okay? And when we're not knee-deep in blood rituals, we're going to take care of you. All right? <laughs>
<laughs> I'm showing you their spirit. <laughs> oh, you'll not get away from America. We almost had you. They're all just panicking. This Jones tells it like it is. His spirit trumps us. What do we do? They're in panic mode right now because I see them for the scum they are, little gremlin rats. <sighs> and Obama was so shaken and slow when he sat there and said all that because he knows he said too much two months ago about we, we need world government. So now we're just going to have all new promos about Americanism versus globalism. Show what globalism is versus nationalism and then show them lecture you that it does not exist three new york times articles so many of them i can't even read them all i read two of them saying world government doesn't exist globalism even globalism doesn't exist in fact print me the definition of globalism before they change you know they'll probably say it doesn't exist now globalism is the modern world system set up by david rockefeller it came out of the Bretton woods agreement it's taught in all graduate student political classes But they say it doesn't exist. Also print me global government definition and global governance definition. I mean, you read the Council on Foreign Relations bi-monthly book, Foreign Affairs. You read the Washington Post uh, publication on foreign affairs. You read, it's all global government, global governance. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to take over. Here's how we're going to control the infrastructure. Here's how we're going to end the family. Everyone live in 200 square foot control pods under total surveillance. I mean, you're reading this stuff. And this is them, right? And we're putting fluoride in the water, but it hasn't lowered fertility enough. We've got to increase it, but the public will complain. So we've got to ridicule those that talk about it and call it conspiracy. And you're just reading the total criminal battle plan. And they just count on you not being able to take the truth. And it's so compartmentalized, only the big scientists and social engineers, scientists run the New World Order. And they think you're all animals, and then they got politicians that, that kind of control it and, 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 and have the wealth. But it is scientists that are actually running it. I mean, they actually come up with the policies that fit into the larger cosmology and man, it is nasty. You know, the Nazis were scientific. And it's super cold-blooded, folks. And the decision's been made that you're an animal and you don't have a right to exist. Then they help turn our young people into the equivalent of, of giant 300-pound toddlers. And then when they, they put memos out at over 100 major universities, there's articles on Infowars.com from mainstream news, which reported like it's a good thing. Wall Street Journal, Associated Press, they're like, well, if, if Trump does win tonight, we need you to come to the counselors. We're going to have cry-ins. That's what they're called. There's going to be Play-Doh and coloring books, and we're going to have Tinker Toys. I'm not joking, Tinker Toys. And then 20-year-old people go and learn to roll around and be pathetic to be conquered. You want to know what global 21st century warfare looks like? You're seeing it, folks. Absolute total warfare with hardcore mercs who were into the psychopathic behavior running the show. So, I mean, Noam Chomsky, they have this whole leftist university-funded combine that exposes the corporations and how they run it and how it's bad. The answer is more big government, more leftist institutions. And, you know, he tells you the truth, but then the answer is tyranny. And then he says owning guns is racist and all this stuff to conquer us. And then he says the Republican Party has become the most dangerous organization in world history. That's right to the technocrat scientific group that's creating a breakaway civilization and is the truest form of elitism and racism against the entire of humanity. And Noam Chomsky has been down the bowels of this thing, a, a veritable gnome, pissing on everyone. And he thinks he's better than you and he can't stand, you're almost out of his grasp. He just cannot stand the Renaissance. It is burning him up at every single level. The pseudo-intellectual. I mean, I could write one of his books in two days, but just add the foppish leftism to it. Just, I mean, just bang out this pseudo-intellectual tribe. Everyone just lauds you. Oh, you're so intellectual. Oh, you have liver spots and curly hair, and you kind of waddle around and talk slow. Oh, wow. Thank you for everything, Noam Chomsky. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done in the universities and this whole corporate wrecked garbage. See, they don't want the rise of men. They don't want individualism. They want centralized control so these people that have insecurity issues can, can mount our heads on the wall metaphorically.
So populism is taking over the world. Oh, no, populism, what's popular? Remember George Will? You're not going to have a mere plurality or majority run things. We have a sovereign party of sovereignty. You can't have Trump. The White House has already stabbed Trump in the back. He didn't know how bad the White House was. He didn't know all the work. He didn't know anything. No, he was gracious because there's transcripts coming out. And there's already partial ones where he's like, oh, Trump's all, and, and, Trump, and, and, and Obama's like, it's really hard with 4,000 people. It'll be hard for you to run it. I mean, that guy's got hundreds of thousands working for him. And, and Trump's like, oh, my, yes. Oh, mm -hmm. that's how he talks to his enemies. Oh, thank you for teaching me, Obama. Thank you for teaching me how I work 18 hours a day and am a bull and I'm self-made and you're this little CIA nothing. So here's, here's Bloomberg. <laughs> Populism takes over the world. Oh, no. When you first encounter the word populism, oh, they're teaching everyone what it means. You might just say it doesn't exist, then we wouldn't have to. You might think it's close to cousins of democracy with all the positive connotations that go along with it. And for some, it may well seem a purveyor of the process by which politicians harness the will of the majority. And they go on about how dangerous and fascist and evil it is. And we've got Obama and we've got Noam Chomsky and we've got everybody here. Just, oh, so elitist, so hanging on their every word, talking very softly, like this is incredible knowledge they're imparting to us. An American first doctrine, Trump. But then, of course, again, I'm going to cover this the next hour. Here it is. Just, just one of the New York Times articles. Globalism, a far-right conspiracy theory buoyed by Trump. That's like saying... If you claim that on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., at the end of it is the capital, can you believe these people? It's like the New York Times uh, in 2008 literally wrote that I was in Chantilly, Virginia, imagining black helicopters and Marines and troops and Secret Service and Hillary and Obama meeting in secret and Richard and Haas coming out and flipping me off. And I mean, all this is on video, the head of the CFR at the time. None of this existed. All on HD video, they said that I was having a full-on schizophrenic hallucination. Now, you talk about a con game, man. You imagine telling your readers that, that I'm insane and that it doesn't exist takes a lot of huevos, a lot of chutzpah. And I guess as long as it held with the readers, by the way, the bottom's fallen out of the New York Times. Their, uh, their, their, their subscriptions and profit in the third quarter Drop. You can look this up. Ninety-seven point five percent, and a bunch of other newspapers did as well. Just you're, you're, I mean, you're gone. You you told by there was no way Trump could be elected. You just kept saying it fifty thousand times a, a week, over and over again, drooling sycophantically. Everyone already hated you and thought you were a joke. CNN all, but now, now, now you're you're tripling down globalism. This global system, how we must embrace globalism, and how it's good to have corporations run everything, and global carbon taxes, and global standardization. Yada yada yada. It doesn't exist now, and it gets worse. Stephen Manning, and Alex Jones are racist. That's right. There's no quotes. There's no proof. There's no nothing. It's just we just we are, and thank God that we have got the New York Times here to save us. And, and it just goes on to say Trump believes in this imaginary thing where we all have one-sided trade deals for special interests to, to rape us. Yeah, it'll be real imaginary when he puts us on the same standards as China for coal power plants and your electricity drops. And watch what happens there, more jobs. It, it, real simple crap like that that you say doesn't exist. I'll, 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 I'll never forget, just, just five, six years ago, they would deny carbon taxes existed. Then suddenly they started admitting they existed. I mean, this this whole game they play. So we're going to come back and get into just the idiocy of their minions, of their servants, when they're talking about how they're going to battle the ignorance of nationalists when your supporters literally are the biggest disenfranchised victim, sad but still dangerous buffoons this world's ever seen. Now, before I go any further... We are running some really great specials, and it's more important than ever to support this broadcast. You can see how InfoWars pays off for you and your family. You get over-the-top, high-quality products that we investigate and personally use, and you support an organization that is completely committed to battling fearlessly for your freedom and our freedom together. We are brothers and sisters, every race, color, and creed, wanting self-determination. And I always use the word win-win, but it's a good term to use. 
and, and they make the point in the movie Arrival, that's, a, I think, a good film with a good message overall, even though it's got Chinese propaganda, communist pro propaganda in it, of course, but, but what movie doesn't know? They've taken over, basically. Everybody should know how deep we are under globalism already. But a zero-sum game, a win-win. And I'm always about a win-win. Civilization is about a win-win. The more you have a win-win, the more you have a civilization. A 360 win is what everyone should want. And I, at a Christian level, spiritual level, it's not like something I do compulsively. I do it innately. That Believe in win-win. I just am so nice. I'm so helpful. I'm so giving. I'm so sharing in my personal life. But not. And, and then I found out weak, evil people always think I must be weak because I was being so nice. So I've learned to withhold that from people that don't deserve it. Because because if you give the average scumbag, we're going to skip this break, you give the average programmed person this win-win, uh, they take it as a weakness. They take it that, oh, I must betray this person as quickly as possible. I'm going to skip this break. I must, I must metaphysically cut their head off as fast as I can and then kill the golden goose. Because they were taught how to not live in civilization in a, in a zero-sum game. They were caught to live in a pie system where the pie is so many grams and so many inches wide and so many inches deep, and that's it forever. And they teach you that, that if someone else is getting something, you're losing. Not that, oh, my God, there's a big middle-class neighborhood being built nearby, and there's people with money moving in. I should go you know, get a piece of property down the road. They're going to build that way in a few years. I bet they'll put a gas station there. I bet I can sell that property for three times what it's worth. No, 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 no. You get mad and then get pissed that people with money are moving in. And that's why you're a loser. Or you don't get involved in the discussions from day one about what's built where, so you're a major player in the whole system when it comes in. No, no, no. You just remove yourself and then let the government run your life when it's there to absolutely give you the minimum to keep you under their control. But then you're all pissed with the government, thinking it's your mommy, your daddy, but pissed at everyone else you see doing well because they're not under the false program you're, you're living in. So they inflict their minions with psychological wounds. And they don't understand why they're so desperate. They don't understand why they're so unhappy. They don't understand why things just get worse and worse. They keep doubling, tripling, quadrupling down the past lies. They keep serving the system more and more. They keep buying into the next level that's supposedly going to deliver them all this. They don't look at Venezuela or Cuba or, or other communist countries like North Korea or what happened in Russia or China. They don't look at how it creates abject hell. All they know is that if they could get something free from someone else, they could win. Zero-sum game. They don't understand 360 win, a, a term I coined. Now, that is utopia. A 360 win is utopia. It's a singularity of a zero-sum game. Where when we capture the understanding of energy and matter then it will only be intellect and, and vision and creativity that will be the currency. And imagine that. That's what you can call heaven. The problem is, for free will to exist, there must always be the will to be destructive and bad. And so we will never reach a perfect nirvana in this third, fourth dimension plane. Every ancient culture said we will transcend to a fifth, sixth dimension. The enemy tells you all day that doesn't exist because they are continually at war with that because they understand it's a zero-sum ascension. But they're always trying to interface with it to get knowledge from the ether so they can use it in this lower plane to dominate everyone. This is the big secret. These are fallen people, folks. They're scum. Now, can Trump actually deliver even 10% of a zero-sum game to everybody? A 360 win? That's up to us. But his spirit... He's aggressive, he's dominant, he doesn't want to be pushed around, he likes to dominate other powerful scumbags. He likes to hunt them. I, I, I guess he looked up a Zodiac, not that I believe in any of this, but it's fine. Uh, I guess he's a Gemini, and if a Chinese Zodiac, he's a dog. I've been calling him a, a lion or a, a bull, but he is a dog. What has more energy and keeps going and going and going and going and is committed? If you call Trump anything, he's dogged. But that's my biggest compliment is that man is, is like a hound. That man never stops. That man's a sheepdog. And that's it. Trump loves people. Everybody I know that knows him for years and his employees and everybody, as long as you're genuine and not a scumbag, he will end up promoting you and, and trying to build. 
but you cross Trump, he then wants to bring you down. And not out of some vindictiveness, but it's a non-zero-sum game. A non-zero-sum game is a win-win. I'm saying a zero-sum game, but a non-zero-sub, uh, non-zero-sum game. I, I, I'm teleprompter-free, folks, and, I, and I'm here just coming from the heart. But absolutely, a non-zero-sum game, a zero-sum game would be we didn't have any numbers. But, I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying. A non-zero-sum game is what I'm getting at. A, a system where you transcend that. The problem is all the utopia pushers tell you, We'll let a giant central computer run our lives. It'll tell us what we do, who we are, what we're going to be in our lives, and it will dole out the resources. And the average person who hasn't lived very much thinks, oh, that sounds great. My mommy will divide the pizza up evenly. No, the ultimate hell on earth would be the zeitgeist movement with a central computer telling you what you do. Plus, who programs the central computer? That's a technocracy. That's the system they're selling as a, quote, grassroots movement but that's why the New York Times and the U.N. endorsed it, because it's such a horrible system. And I was told by Peter Joseph in an interview like eight, nine years ago, he said, you will be sent to a re-education camp if you don't accept this. And then he told everybody he never said that, even though we have the interview where he says you'll be sent to a re-education camp. You'll be re-educated. They will not ever be truthful with you, and if they slip up, they'll then deny it. This is about them deciding your destiny. Peter Joseph, Noam Chomsky, Hillary Clinton. David Rockefeller, the globalists. It's about them being gods, them arranging humans in the shapes and systems they want. Look at the North Korean displays. I want a non-zero-sum game, a non-zero-sum game, a true 360 win. Transcending the control arms, transcending the system, which will never truly attain, but one-tenth of attaining it is heaven compared to what these globalists want to set up. But let's show the, the, the dumbed-down throngs of desperate people drinking fluoride, eating GMO their whole lives, watching TV all day, lifestyles of the rich and famous, making themselves feel inadequate because they can't ever attain something that doesn't even really exist, and that those Hollywood people are the most unhappy folks anywhere, planting a garden, loving their husband or wife, going and helping people, being involved, building things, enjoying themselves, uh, enjoying the beauty God gave us. All of this would help them begin to transcend the ugly enemy that seeks to shutter our minds and force us into their matrix-like, fake TV land proto-matrix. Let's go to that club. Sexist, anti-gay, Donald Trump is not okay. Racist, sexist, anti-gay, Donald Trump is not okay. I'm no longer going to be silent. We're going to take to the streets. We're no longer going to let people get away with their racistness, their bigotry, their hate against gays and trans and people of color. We're no longer going to accept it. We're going to stand up like we should have been doing years ago, and we're going to fight for the rights that we should have as human beings. It's power in numbers, and it's power when people agree that we're tired of the injustice. We're no longer going to sit around. So you can look at the change. You can see it in Chicago. You can see it in L.A. You can see it in New York. We're no longer going to sit and let anything just happen to us. We have a voice, and we're going to use it. We're going to break, but uh, ima imagine, folks, they believe TV, they believe the quotes that Donald Trump calls them stupid, that he said things about Mexicans he never did, all out of context. They really have been filled full of race consciousness themselves, totally hyped up with it, and then there's a backlash against it, and they want to say it's all white racism. Well, the same white people that voted in Barack Obama voted in Donald J. Trump. And these folks don't want prosperity. They, their whole identity is being victims. Imagine how sad that is. Their identity, the air they breathe, is how they've been wrong. That's their possession. That's who they are. They've had their destiny stolen. Welcome back. I have an important question that Mark Dice is about to ask. What is really wrong with millennials? You're a millennial? Yes. What the <laughs> hell is wrong with your generation? There's nothing wrong with our generation. Nothing? <laughs> No, I don't think so. Are you guys the so. greatest generation? No, I think we have a lot to learn, but we are who we are. <laughs> uh, talking to millennials about what the hell is wrong with your generation? There's nothing wrong with it. We're the best looking generation there is. Uh, look so at tell us more about the millennials. Look at all the girls walking around. You know what I mean? 
What the hell is wrong with your generation? Excuse you? Yeah. I have a way to that. attack someone uh, out of nowhere, on the street. Oh, I mean, you need a safe my... space. Do you need a safe space? Well, I don't need a safe space, but the correct forum to attack me when, I, when I'm when i ready so I can defend our generation. Okay, yeah. well, you can defend it. What the hell's wrong with you guys? There's nothing wrong with nothing. us. Are you a millennial? Yes. Yes. What the heck is wrong with your generation? Uh, I don't think a whole lot. I think it's a pretty good generation. Pretty good generation. Would you guys say you're lacking in any areas of, like, common sense or morality or... Uh, Personally, no. Well, personally, there are, thankfully, there are exceptions. Yeah, sure. As a whole, would you say that your generation is just a bunch of brain-dead zombies? No. No. Are you guys millennials? Yeah. Yes. We're just talking to millennials <laughs> to try to figure out what the hell's wrong with you guys. Yeah. What isn't wrong? What isn't wrong? That's, I guess, that's some, oh no. Are you guys millennials? Yeah, Technically. 100%. What is wrong with your generation? It's the dating life, actually. The dating life is terrible. Yeah. Because the men are a bunch of cowards and need to pick up women through apps? So yeah. they yes. can't approach you guys yes. with, like, Absolutely. normal men? 100%. So the men are basically a bunch of effeminate little pussies? I've not had a guy walk up to me in so long, I can't even tell you. And I know I'm a good-looking person, so... Because <laughs> they have no balls, they, they just need to click through their yeah, apps and yeah, masturbate yeah. all day? Absolutely, 100%. Technology. I don't think there's anything wrong with us. I think we're just having a good time. Having a good time. Enjoying the youth. Enjoying your youth. Yep, okay. absolutely. Trying to figure out what the hell is wrong with your generation. I don't think there's anything wrong with my generation. Nothing is wrong. If you could make some improvements, what, what areas do you think would be improved, should be improved? Um, just everyone being nice to everybody. Everyone being nicer to everyone. Yeah. More safe spaces? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <sighs> oh my gosh. Got a couple of young millennials here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Trying to find out what is wrong with your generation. What, what happened to you guys? Nothing. Kids weren't spanked. They weren't spanked. Oh, gosh. <laughs> when they got in trouble, yeah. <laughs> so now they're just completely out of control and out of their mind? Yeah, they weren't disciplined, right? Thank you for thinking. You're uh, welcome. A lot of people are offended <laughs> by me saying there's something wrong with their generation. They need a safe space, apparently. What, is, oh, what do no. you think is wrong with our generation? Not enough supervision from the parents, too many single-parent families, uh, too much technology at too young of an age, uh, having endless porn in your pocket when you're 13 years old, um, watching adult content when you're <laughs> preteen. But then wouldn't that really not pertain to our generation, but rather yours, because you guys are the parenting ones? Well, that's you, we're trying to figure out, find out what the hell went wrong. <laughs> trying to find out what the hell went wrong with your generation. Why? What's wrong with it? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Like, uh, if your generation could make some improvements, what, what would you think should be improved? Um, maybe the cell phone usage. <gasps> there you go. That's yeah. one thing. Because he always complains about that, so. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No. That's it. M social media, maybe? Yes, less social media. Now we're on to something. <laughs> we're getting to the bottom of the problem. Yeah. Trying to find out what the hell's wrong with you guys. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing is wrong with you. Nothing. If you could make some improvements in your generation, what what should be improved? Um, kids should start reading more often and uh, stay off of uh, video games and get out here in the open. Do some physical activities instead of staying home, playing video games, watching TV. Actually get out and do some of the stuff that you see on TV. Now we're making some progress. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for thinking. We'll be back, be folks. Stay with us. We have a brave man joining us, Anthony Frieda. I've, I've been working with this guy for, I don't know, more than 10 years. Uh, we would uh, promote a lot of his artwork, exposing the fake wars, the Republicans, the Democrats, their, their warmongering. And I know he's been a somewhat of a supporter of Trump, though he's been obviously attacked a lot, demonized a lot. And he ended up giving us a lot of intel about what leftist groups and people were up to, running false flags, you name it, uh, in the last year. Uh, against Trump. I don't know how much that he can get into today, but this is inside the East Coast, inside New York, with a very you know, popular top-tier artist that does major magazine covers for uh, the top magazines and, and uh, publications in the country. So 
for him to be coming on the show, uh, it takes a lot of courage because these people blackball. They are anti-free speech. They are anti-liberal. They're very, 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 very nasty. And they are making a move uh, against the American people. But uh, and he has some issues with Trump. So do I. And, and I think one of them, Snowden, I said yesterday, it was whistleblowers like Snowden and Bradley Manning and uh, all the other things that uh, happened uh, that led the way for WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, that led the way uh, for, and of course Assange came before that, but it was just overall burgeoning of what we've seen and an explosion in the last few years uh, in people exposing things with the DC leaks and the latest leaks that went to WikiLeaks and so much more. So if Trump got in, mainly because of the whistleblowers exposing Clinton and this whole Democratic, Republican corrupt apparatus, that means the intelligence community, the patriots across the world, not just here in the U.S., but mainly here in the U.S., are going to want to see real change, or Trump will go the same way as the Clinton dynasty uh, if he engages in the same type of activities. I don't think Trump inherently will because he's not corrupt. He's not a mastermind type. He leads from the front, not by stealth. Uh, but still, people are expecting that. And so there's a few issues I have with Trump. One of them is the fact that he's called Snowden a traitor. A few years ago, and I get the idea. You're, you know, you're taking classified information out. You could hurt the country. But what if the information is criminal? What if it shows a breakaway state that's clearly doing things that are against the people? We owe Snowden. We owe Julian Assange. Uh, we owe Chelsea Manning. We owe all these men and women uh, an incredible debt of gratitude. They're heroes. Now I understand that the, if you if, if people don't get punished for giving out classified information then folks will start selling it. Well, Hillary got caught doing that to the Russians and the Chinese and everybody else, then blaming Trump for that. So, so think about that long and hard. If we don't prosecute people that really do sell out our sovereignty, but then go after whistleblowers that are defending our sovereignty and the health of our nation, it's a fraud. So I'll give Trump this. This is what the former head of the NSA technical has said, uh, William Benny on the show. Yeah, Snowden might get a small charge, but everybody else needs to be charged as well. And so until you do that, you can't. So I think we point out that if you're exposing serious crimes, you should go to Congress first. But if they don't act, you have a right and responsibility to expose it. But the whole criminal state doesn't want that. So I think the most important part of this ongoing revolution against tyranny is that we kept calling for good people in government to stand up and do what was right. Well, they did. That's why George Soros and others have tried to start a war within the government and a war with the people, a civil war, is to distract from Americans of every race, color, and creed, government, non-government, coming together to expose corruption wherever you find it. So the real heroes the last few years are the hackers, the white hat hackers, they are the Snowdens, they are the Assanges, uh, they are the Chelsea Mannings, they are the DC Leaks folks, they're the poor man that got shot four times in the back. And basically, WikiLeaks said that was their source. These are the heroes. And then from that point, you have the dissident artist and people that I would call real classical liberals. I think it's fair to call Anthony Frieda that. Very talented artist who sees the illiberal, tyrannical activities of the Democrats working with the Republicans and who has had the will to come out against it to a lot of attacks. Now, think about we're such a free country and the left so open and inclusive, but he can't do that without being persecuted. That's because... The left has died in this country, and they've created a cult that serves tyranny. We're seeing populism through the Tea Party that got so demonized that isn't racist on average that I told you was the best shot we had to take the country back. I told you years ago, they're putting all their money, Republicans and Democrats, in the establishment into stopping a Tea Party insurrection of libertarian populism through the Republican Party that at least in some of their planks is more Americana. That's now happened. Will Trump deliver? That's up to him. That's up to us holding his feet to the fire. But regardless, a huge repudiation of MSM and all their lies, a huge repudiation of the, of the pollsters, a huge repudiation of the stonewalling of the New York Times and the Washington Post and others about the fact that Obamacare is a ripoff written by insurance companies to scam us. The fact that our borders are wide open and we're creating a permanent underclass and driving down wages. The fact that it's not racist to make immigrants come here legally, every other country does it. The fact that we're sick as Americans, people who either stood by and were neutral in 2008, as I was because McCain was so bad, 
or folks that voted for Obama because they wanted to rep repudiate Bush, you don't now call those people racist and call it a white lash. So to Michael Moore's credit, he has said this was not about racism. He lately has changed his tune because he knows no one's buying it. He wants to remain popular. To, to promote his new movie, he went out three weeks ago and said, Trump's probably going to win, and uh, he has a lot of good points. Because they understand, folks, they're in a crisis mode. So what are they doing a week after the election? They are intensifying what failed. They're digging their hole deeper. They are saying globalism doesn't exist, much less world government. And next hour, we have a piece, five minutes long now, of world leaders, including Obama, calling for global government, saying give up our sovereignty, give up our freedom of action. That's like a man grabbing a kid out of a schoolyard, putting handcuffs on him and saying, let me bind your feet, don't fight, it'll all be okay. That's when you find yourself in a basement with a blowtorch. Okay? So this is classic serial killer stuff, but to the whole culture. So before we go to Frida, here's Obama in September at the UN saying, give up our sovereignty. Here it is. And we can only realize the promise of this institution's founding to replace the ravages of war with cooperation if powerful nations like my own accept constraints. Sometimes I'm criticized in my own country for professing a belief in international norms and multilateral institutions, but I am convinced that in the long run, giving up some freedom of action, not giving up our ability to protect ourselves or pursue our core interests, but binding ourselves to international rules over the long term enhances our security. So who makes those rules? Private corporations and secret boards. The TPP is burning down. The carbon tax is about to be removed. These are huge victories. World War III has been averted. Death con nuclear threat reduced to safest level following Donald Trump victory. That's out of the Express News in England. Trump and Putin talked yesterday and said they want to work together to de-escalate military confrontations and work to stop ISIS. Boy, that sounds like detente to me. That sounds like classical liberal to me. We're joined by Anthony Frieda, anthonyfrieda.com. I'm not going to go over his whole bio, but he's one of the top illustrators in the country, for everything from Rolling Stone and New Yorker Magazine, and uh, he is here joining us now. I don't know how much you can get into what you saw behind the scenes in the art world, uh, but I know you gave us some of that off the record. Pretty shocking information. Where do you want to start, my friend? Well, I think, um, you know, the fact that you have been consistent, I started listening to you during the Bush era, and... Um, you held Obama to the same standard you held Bush to. So that to me gives you credibility that and an objectivity that almost nobody has. I mean, except you. Um, everybody seems to, you know, get into this tribal mentality where there's just hypocrisy on both sides and hypocrisy everywhere. Uh, it's a hypocrisy nation we've become. Uh, but I know you've been you remain consistent and and I hope and I and I I believe you will hold Trump to the same standard that you held his predecessors to. And, uh, I will. I know you will. And that, that'll give you credit, even further credibility, no matter what, you know, listen, I, I get a lot of uh, stuff, a lot of crap for um, defending you, but that's because I've seen you in your entirety over, um, you know, a decade. So I can judge you, uh, I think, objectively, and you remain consistent. You're anti-war, you're pro-freedom, you're pro-liberty. You're a pro-constitution, and uh, that's supposed to be what, <laughs> what the left is, you know? So to me, that is very interesting with this nexus where uh, pro real progressive anti-war, uh, pro-civil liberty uh, liberals meet the libertarians. That nexus is where I live. That little world is interesting because um, it's a non-interventionist policy like uh, Ron Paul talks about. But I think, I think the biggest problem we face now is, is like you talk about this tribalism. I mean, my God, it's taken this, it's, it's gone to extremes. Like people hated Bush on the left, but I mean, they want to murder Trump. They didn't want to murder Bush. They just, you know, I thought he was like this fool or this idiot that they could make fun of, but they didn't, they didn't despise him. Like, like I, I feel now and I see now. So it's reached a dangerous level um, that um, I think threatens, you know, any stability in this country.
I agree. And then you look at who's behind him. People like George Soros, he's about as opposite of liberal as you can get. I mean, admittedly, overthrows countries. He stabilizes completely amoral. Uh, started off as a Nazi collaborator. I mean, who can make this up? Yeah, he's a lot of less. Uh, yeah, and I, I think a lot of people don't know that. So what I try to do is try to bridge gaps between the, whatever you want to call it, the alt-right media and the alt-left media or the mainstream media. Because I think that, that you know, we're in these little echo chambers where uh, people who listen to Breitbart or you are in their little echo chamber. And then people who listen to Media Matters or MSNBC are in their echo chamber. So I'll tell you what, Anthony Frieda, let's talk about how do we get out of the echo chamber? Because I'd love to do that. I was talking to the New York Times yesterday and I can tell them we're listening to a word I say. How do we get them out of the echo chamber? We'll be right back. Stay with us. Now, we've got William F. Jasper, the editor at the New American Magazine, the oldest organization in the country, John Birch Society, fighting the globalists for 60 years. They're called racist, every other name with zero proof. Just like they're calling myself racist, they're calling Stephen Bannon, the chief counselor to Trump racist with zero evidence. They just keep throwing it out there where it doesn't hurt people anymore. The problem is when you're talking about real racist, then now they get a free pass. So there is a rise of more white racists now because people are sick of being called racist by racist blacks, racist Hispanics, and others. That's why I said we've got to get out of this echo chamber because, man, you go out to these anti-Trump rallies, it is the most anti-white thing. And they somehow see America as white, even though... Hispanics are about to be, in like 15 years, 70% of the country. They're already basically half. It's your country. Now, most Hispanics just want a future and a job and are very compatible with Americana ideas. But there's an attempt by the social engineers to put everybody in this tribalism that Anthony Frieda, one of the top uh, editorial cartoonists, uh, graphic artists, uh, painters in the country, uh, is warning about it. He's desperately trying to get, Hillary defines us as this, the alt-right, I just call it the new media that's the, that's Americana and free market uh, with the alt left. Uh, but all I call us is people that are off the reservation, aren't buying into this. And the same folks that voted in Obama, desperately hitting the panic button, are now voting in Trump. And if he doesn't deliver, he'll be anathema because folks are in love with Trump. Record numbers of blacks, record numbers of Hispanics broke the matrix and voted for him. Anthony, though, great point. We're showing some of your amazing art for folks that are watching on TV. Infowars.com forward slash show. If you're a radio listener to find the feeds. One of the best, probably the best artists out there when it comes down to it. I, I, I got to say, his art is hanging up all over our office. Uh, Anthony, this is a short segment, long segment coming up. But getting into that echo chamber, how do you break people out of the cognitive dissonance? Because I'm ready to hear a leftist tell me their views. They're not really leftists today. Now they will never even talk to our reporters. Uh, they just absolutely just scream incoherently and, and, and just scream, you're a racist, you're a homophobe. If you tell them Donald Trump was a trailblazer of actual gay rights and that some conservatives criticize him for that, they get even more mad. It's just they're so dedicated to the twist, uh, twisted information. Yeah, well, it's a tale of two countries, right? I mean, this demonization campaign has been incredibly successful, but at the same time, it's failed because Donald Trump is president. So this concerted, uh, unprecedented demoniz dehumanization and demonization campaign against Donald Trump from every quarter, the, the media and Hillary nonstop ads uh, demonizing him. And, and I, I went to a magazine uh, uh, store um, in New York City uh, a couple months ago. And every cover, as I looked up at this magazine stand, was either he was Hitler or he was the KKK. And these are done by illustrators or designers that I know personally. And every single one was like, he, it was so extreme, so over the top. So there's a thing called Godwin's Law. Where once you compare your adversary to Hitler, you lost the argument because it's ridiculous. He's not Hitler, okay? You know, you can have your problems with Trump. I have problems with Trump. The guy is not freaking Hitler, okay? You got to get that out of your mind. My own mother, who I love dearly, um, she was a big Hillary person because she wanted to see a woman present. Uh, and she hated Trump because she watches The View, she watches MSNBC, and just this concerted demonization, dehumanizing campaign over the last year has convinced her that he is the worst human being on earth. And it's almost impossible. There's nothing I could do to, to, um, to convince her otherwise. I mean, no matter how much evidence I present to the contrary, you know, she's been presented with this onslaught. I mean, a daily onslaught. I, I talk about the two minutes of hate. It's, it's literally out of the playbook from 1984, where um, 
you, you know, you project everything you hate about the world onto this one person, and then you could do anything to him or his followers and feel morally justified because he's evil. He's the, he's the poster boy for evil. That is actually a Nazi tactic. What's, what, I mean, what's funny is you could compare Hillary actually to Hitler. There's few people you can that are actually that bad, but she actually warmongering, lying, into <laughs> killing, throwing fits. She reportedly on election night, I was told this by insiders, now it's confirmed, sort of physically attacking people. Hitler would do that. I mean, she's a lot closer to Hitler than Donald Trump. You can make a better case. But Trump hasn't killed anybody. Who does he kill? I mean, even even if you make the extreme argument that you know he wants to uh, keep Muslim uh, immigration from happening, Hillary wants to murder the Muslim. So which is worse? So like if if you're trying to defend Muslims, uh, you know he wants to, to restrict the immigration to prevent. Um, Listen, if he stops ISIS, that will save hundreds of thousands, about millions of Muslims. That's the main group they're killing. They're the radical, extreme, ultra right wing crazies. So why is she allied with them? Well, everything is upside down because I mean, you think about that 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 alliance between the left and, and radical or Islam is, is odd to me because, you know, they, they promote um, transgenderism and, and uh, homosexuality, which is which is fine. I have no problem with that. But then to embrace Islam, which is I mean, imagine what a transgender guy would dead it stay there. Let's come back with that exactly, and that's what pisses people off that are thinkers is that. It's just upside down. I mean, she, her girlfriend is Uma Abedin, whose mother's the top pusher of cutting little girls' genitals off. It's like, and then they're into Satanism. They're a bunch of freaks, folks. We'll be back with Anthony Frieda. I want to get back into radical Islam with Anthony Frieda, one of the top graphic uh, illustrators and designers in the country. And I don't know how much of this he can get into it. He, he said before he, he can get a little bit into it, but behind the scenes with the top liberal illustrators, the stuff he saw, the stuff he heard, concerning myself, Donald Trump, you name it, and, and things that he told us we then encountered. Uh, and it's it's really, really dirty tricks, folks. Putting racist stuff out, saying we did it, things like that. And we're seeing a lot more of this starting to come out and start happening. So this guy's a lot of courage. I've always told him so he doesn't get blackballed, he should just erect sell his great posters and material, which he does. And uh, you can find all that on his website, anthonyfrieda.com. It's amongst the best out there, incredibly prolific. Uh, it's just uh, ridiculous uh, how good it all is. In fact, sometime, I know he's already put out coffee book, uh, coffee table stuff. But I'd love to put out an InfoWars backed one maybe sometime. Um, I'm just saying all this on air because it's it's so amazing. This is the type of stuff you want on your walls and on your coffee table. At your business, you name it, because it, it, it's it's transcendent. It's very, very bipartisan. He didn't always be plugging his art here, but I am. Because it speaks to everyone, the humanity in us, and brings us together which spoken word is hard to do. We're going back to Frida here in a moment. I wanted to mention this. Uh, we have Fox News, CNN, MSNBC on in the control room monitoring it. Russia, after a three-week ceasefire, which the Al-Qaeda folks, that's ISIS, broke, they have uh, resumed strikes. And so this is a very, very serious war. The issue is the West started it five years ago. Hillary started it five years ago. John Kerry started it five years ago. And that's why they're the ones that basically take the blame for it. They keep saying Assad not stepping down is what did it. He's ready to step down when Al-Qaeda and ISIS pull out, and then they'll have elections. He wants to leave. He's, he, he grew up in England. He doesn't want to be in this. But but Al-Qaeda is going to force the Sunnis uh, that aren't part of their group, the Shiites that aren't part of it, the Alawites, the Christians that are left, to convert to the most radical forms of Islam. They make people eat dead bodies. They eat hearts. They, 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 they just do, they throw people off bridges. They throw gays off buildings, they, they murder Catholic priests. Why does anyone put up with this? And, and this is who our government's pushing and now saying Trump's going to cause World War III after defense condition, nuclear threat reduced to safest and lowest level following Trump victory. Trump and Putin, we will destroy ISIS. If Trump brings his promises to life, it will radically change the situation. You can read this on Infowars.com, the full transcript of their conversation. Trump put out a transcript. The Russians put out a transcript. It's the same conversation. Trump is very, very sophisticated already doing that. So the media can't spin what he said or did. He just said, you know, we're, we're with the Russian people. We're with, uh, you know, Russia. We, we, we look forward to a good relationship, bilateral ties, uh, taking out radical Islam together, uh, constructive cooperation. Russia doesn't control Hollywood like China does now. It's been announced. I told you first five years ago. I mean, I knew every movie, uh, China's the hero. I mean, every movie I go see that's an action adventure or a sci-fi movie, just every one. I mean, I knew when I went to see uh, 
arrival. It'd be the Chinese saved us. Of course they did. Every, every, every movie. Just every movie. Uh, they have final cut now in all the major films. Uh, they're buying up the final six uh, production houses. This is the communist Chinese, folks, the biggest murderers in history. So the point is, Russia has two and a half bases. They have two main bases, a little sub base. We have thousands. They're not invading anybody. They're not. It's the West under Cheney in 2008 and now under Obama that is starting a war with Russia. And Russia needs to be stabilized. I don't want war with China either. I want to see China free. But China has been given all the rare earth minerals, all the major ports, the Panama Canal. They're taking over, okay, because the globalists made a deal with them. The globalists are allied against all sovereign nations with China against the world. That includes India. It includes everybody, okay? So you need to understand that Hollywood is completely sold out to it. The Chinese government brags about it, how pathetic we are. It's, it's, it's sick. People say, how did you know this first? Five years ago, they started telling what movies could come out, like Red Dawn 2. They had to re-edit it and take China out of it. I mean, and then I talked to people in Hollywood. They said, listen, most of our stuff's financed by China now. We're really going bankrupt. They're just funneling tens of billions, and it's going to be hundreds of billions next year. I mean, I've sat there with the top lawyers in Hollywood, okay, because you at least want me to do projects with them. It's all a total waste of time, but I'd be out there every month dealing with these people, and it's just a joke. And really what it was, dangling movie roles in front of me, if I just shut up, I don't want your stupid movies. I mean, in fact, I've licensed, I'm not bragging, this show to a bunch of big movies. You want to use a clip of the show? Go ahead. People are like, you're in this movie, you're in that movie. I don't even go watch them. The point is, is that we're winning the culture war as true libertarian patriots. The globalists, though, are coming in with both feet on top of us. I want to talk to Anthony Frieda how they'll try to shut that down or if he thinks they will in a moment. But first, all that good news is happening. Uh, we have a lost leader that's about to sell out this week. In fact, some sizes will sell out any day now. It's the red uh, for voting day. Trump is my president. On the back, it says legalized freedom. Infowars.com. It's nine ninety five shipping included. So that shirt is at cost. All right. In fact, we lose money on a 4XL. Check it out. Get it and exercise your free speech. It's very simple. Trump is my president on the back. Legalize freedom, infowars.com. And I wear this shirt out in public to exercise my free will over people that want to get in my face and refuse me service and act weird or blow up at me so I can talk to them and try to deprogram them. So it's a historic shirt. If you want it, InfoWarsStore.com. This is not support the broadcast because we basically lose money on it. But be sure and get those. Uh, we have the new BioPCA that has all the known organic compounds that are healthy and natural uh, to grow your nails, have healthier hair, uh, you name it, and skin. One of the ingredients we have in it is in the major leading competitors for $44, $55, $60. I mean, I can't believe the ripoffs in hair, nail, and skin. The word is, though, people only buy what's really expensive. They think it must be better. So I'm here telling you, it's 1995. Some super formulas have really inexpensive, high-quality ingredients, so we can sell it incredibly low. Now, we only make like five bucks on this because it's discounted out of the gates. So it'll be $29.95 soon. It'll be well worth it. But I want to introduce you to what we came out with, the ultimate hair, nail, and skin formula. That's BioPCA, a great gift to give your wife or girlfriend, but men need it as well. If something's good for your hair and nails and skin... Wink, wink, folks. You know, think for yourselves. It's good for everything. It's so important. Infowarslife.com, infowarsstore.com, or call toll free 888 253 3139. 888 253 3139. There's a lot of other specials running as well. I want to thank you all for your broad, uh, for your support because you make the broadcast pop, uh, possible across the board. I mean, how does Anthony Frieda more and more uh, come out and say what he wants to say in the arts, in film, in. Uh, when I criticized Obama years ago, building this facility here in Austin, Texas, that has a lot of Hollywood folks here, they told me, they said, listen, we came and put your lights in. We came and put your green screen in. We can't do work with you anymore. We'll be blackballed by Robert Rodriguez and the Hollywood folks here in town. And so we have to get people in from Dallas to set up our stages and our equipment because that, that's run by TV slash movie people. That's who you get. And you think unions are bad, just try the cult of the fascist liberals. They mean business. And they've told me that, ha, 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 you're blackballed. Well, guess what? Thank God I'm not associated with you. We had 80 plus million viewers last week just on our streams of videos on Facebook and YouTube and everywhere else. So we used to get 20 million a week. We thought that was really great. So thank God I'm not with the New York Times, MSNBC, and Robert Rodriguez with his TV empire propped up by the government. So... Uh, you failed again. You're a joke. 
Uh, I'm sorry, that's just the facts. Now, going back to Anthony Frieda, finishing up with Islam and the super orthodox radical form of it via Wahhabism was taking over. When you talk to your leftist friends about this, you told me you have, how do they juxtapose these rallies saying Donald Trump's a homophobe and screaming and yelling that he wants to you know, kill Mexicans or whatever, while there's women in hijabs or, or full burqas, basically on leashes there with their husbands, running around, scrabbling around. I mean, how do they, how do they juxtapose this, Anthony Frieda? It's a mystery to me. I mean, I'm against all tyranny, and there are tyrannical systems that have been codified into, into you know, uh, 10 or 11 Muslim countries where, I mean, women are treated like slaves. Homosexuals are murdered, okay? Yeah. And they say that Donald Trump is a homophobe. I mean, give me a break. What, what did he ever do to gay people? What, and what do you, more importantly, what do you think he's going to do to gay people once he's elected? Nothing. It's ridiculous. It, it, it's it's based on this hysteria and these are smart people but they bought into this this narrative that he is the epitome of evil and all the evil in the world is projected onto him and uh in some bizarre way the uh, uh goodness has been projected onto hillary which is just it, it's just at odds with reality and um i try to be objective and i know you do too and that's what i respect objectivity but partisanship is anathema to objectivity so what happens is people project all the ills of, of the world and all their own uh, failures and fears onto their uh, enemy and they discard any evidence to the contrary. So this is, this is the, the element of tribalism, which is um, still this intractable problem that I, I, don't know, I don't know how we overcome it as a species. I think it's our Achilles' heel as a species. Because I think at, at one point it was, um, you know, it was a critical survival instinct. But now it's become an impediment and maybe an existential threat to the, our civilization and, and our culture and any advancement or uh, hope for enlightenment as a species. So we have to overcome that. But it's built into our DNA. We're good. They're bad. So the people who, who hate uh, Trump have been just brutally and viciously uh, assaulted with, with a demonization campaign. And uh, he hates Muslims. He hates gays. He hates trans. He hates, he hates everybody, right? <laughs> I mean, got, this gives the same guy, I try to tell my mother, you know, who I love. This is the same guy, you know, who was a Democrat in New York. Same guy from, you know, The Apprentice. The same guy. All of a sudden, in two years, he became like Hitler. How did that happen? It didn't happen. Well, their new thing is to take the fake stuff they claimed he stood for, and now that he's not doing that, they're claiming he's flip-flopping and trying to take out his base. That's the latest attack. But then when you go look at what he actually said, this is exactly what he always said. We're going to get rid of the mandate. We're going to get rid of making you go out and get this. But we're going to make the corporations uh, that are making all this money cover pre-existing conditions. And, and sure, it's a good idea for people 26 years old who are in college or whatever to be able to stay on their parents' insurance. So because he is for a couple of good parts, they're now saying he's lying and, and isn't going to actually get rid of Obamacare. I mean, it, they're just so deceptive. Well, yeah, and that's what surprised That's the one thing that surprised me is that their, listen, that their attack plan on Donald Trump backfired. He's going to be president, all right? It didn't work, but they're doubling down on it. So that's kind of shocking to me. I thought that's my next question. I mean, the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, MSNBC, they're not stopping. They're getting worse than ever. And so when a black crowd of racist thugs beat up a white guy because he's a Trump supporter and a congressman brings it up, we'll play it in a minute, they say, oh, that wasn't racial. Well, of course it's racial. Imagine if a bunch of white people beat up a Democrat supporter that was uh, black. They'd say it was racial. The media acts like everybody isn't on the Internet and doesn't know CNN's covering that up. They don't, uh, I, mean, I don't get why they're so arrogant. If I was doing as bad as they were, if I had an audience, an average size of 100,000, I would realize what I'm saying has been rejected. Now, I say what I believe and what's common sense, so obviously that's why it's popular. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I don't tailor my message, but they claim they want ratings. They No, no, no. They're only further digging their hole, burning themselves up in self-immolation. So, so here's my question. Well, how far does it go? Where do they end up? Because unless they shut us down, they have no future. I mean, because they can't operate in this pure deception mode while there's other people there to call them out on it. But here's the deal. They're already so hated, except by small pools of idiots that buy into their lies, 
you know, that run around, you know, acting like idiots, that even if they took us off the air, the damage is already done. Nationalism against globalism is rising, Anthony. Yeah. Well, it, it's hard to see where this is going to go out because um, how it's going to wind up because, yes, at one point they have failed. They're, uh, like I say, Donald Trump's going to be elected, even though there's this massive concerted campaign to dehumanize him and destroy him. Fail. It failed, but half the country still thinks he's Hitler, right? And also, it was effective in that sense. And they still, listen, I, I want the mainstream media to die. They, they've just failed us in every sense. They've lied us into the Iraq war. They've lied us into, into the Libyan war. They, they have so much blood on their hands. And what's disgraceful to me is that they have the, the temerity to attack you. They have blood on their hands. They, they, are, they are guilty of crimes against humanity. They're oh, yeah, that's the biggest thing they hated about Trump. They kept saying, even in the debates, the first debate, no, you were not against the Iraq war. We produced four clips before the war of him saying, I don't think it's a good idea. Bush shouldn't do it. They're probably not the folks that attacked us. And then several clips while it was first happening, Trump was being criticized on CNN. And we played the clips for me. And then they just say, no, you were for the war because they all know they were for it bipartisanly. They're discredited in one of his strongest suits. They don't want to give it to him. That's right. And even more than that, it's so hypocritical because this is the same media that lied the world lied to the world about the weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda, even though UN uh, weapons inspector said it was untrue. And, and Hillary promoted this war, which was, this is my biggest beef with uh, Her Highness Hillary, that she promoted the Iraq war. Every single lie, she aggressively cheerleaded. They were worse than Bush. They, they, they intensified. Uh, uh, even before Bush got in, the draconian sanctions that killed a half million kids and their secretary of state bragged about it on 60 Minutes and on NBC. I mean, again, next level evil. Speaking of the race painting, here's a congressman. He's on the air yesterday, Jack Kingston, uh, with Tapper, so arrogant, and, he, and they're showing footage of, of, of black racists beating up a white Trump supporter. And then they say, why would you bring up race when clearly it's a racial political attack when the whole discussion that they're on the show for 10 minutes before is about how Trump supporters are attacking uh, Hispanics and blacks. They have no footage of it. Here's real footage. And their response is to say that he's being racist. Total inversion of reality. Here it is. Uh, and uh, Congressman Kingston, I know you want to talk about this as well. Well, well I, I just wanted to remind everybody that the only headquarters that was attacked during the campaign was a Republican headquarters in North Carolina. Um, the only people who have been arrested, to my knowledge, so far. 71 protesters in Portland, Oregon. Um, we know in Chicago, for example, that a, a white Trump voter was beat up by African American men. Um, and we also know why, why, does, it why, does, it, why does it matter the, the, the race of the race of the people that beat them up? The, because that's what the topic is here. Um, uh, just yeah. to quote uh, xenophobia, homophobia, racist, and sexist. That's what we we talked about in the last. I had to do was say a, a Trump voter was beaten up. I don't know why you mentioned the race. Because of... I didn't bring it up. You guys brought it up. <laughs> yeah, this incident. It, Chicago? And, and yes. And, and let me uh, say that's this. enough. That's more. enough. Uh, again, Anthony Frieda, uh, AnthonyFrieda.com. This is just illustrative how they won't admit that they're the ones pushing race war. And then they just make it up that Trump supporters are doing all this stuff. But they don't understand the Internet is there a hundred times bigger exposing them. Yeah, well, that's, that's, I mean, it's laughable. The people obsess on race 24 hours a day say, how dare you bring up race? You know, it's like, that's all you ever talk about. Let's get beyond this race. Let's not focus on race. Let's focus on policy. Let's focus on reality. Let's focus on what is the future of our country and um, how can this new presidency change the course of the failed policy? Well, that's right. Let's talk about how Trump wins then. What does he really do? If he cuts taxes for poor people, it's a win. If he doesn't have war with Russia, it's a win. I mean, if he gets rid of the TPP, it's a win. All that's already happening. So Trump is already delivering like no president I've ever seen. If we support him early on, he'll get a lot of good stuff done. Stay with us. We're sending out an SOS across the world. The globalism is using modern leftist tactics to end free speech and set up tyranny. They'll use right-wingers as well. And what, what we're seeing Trump do is appoint an anti-globalist like Stephen Bannon, who they're calling racist and a Nazi and you know all this made-up crap. Well, I know he's a patriot. And then they'll also appoint Rince Priebus, who's an establishment wonk who can kind of navigate things. And I said this yesterday, and it's being repeated now, and that's what the actually the campaign saying is, 
you know, Trump and Bannon steer the ship. They give the orders, and the guy at the wheel is is uh, Priebus. We'll see what happens. But that's what Trump does is he'll have both sides in his organization to try to control them all. Giuliani's got his big issues, his stop and frisk, all that, uh, big problems with him. But but he was instrumental in a lot of the stuff that came out that actually helped bring down Hillary. I get what Trump's doing, rewarding people that helped him. But John Bolton, uh, as Rand Paul has warned an article on Infowars.com, don't appoint pro-war Bolton Secretary of State. Uh, Bolton is a true piece of work. You've got you've got all this detente. You've got Russia and the United States coming towards each other when there's no reason to be fighting. And Bolton is somebody that has been on Fox News every time I turn around, basically as hawkish as Hillary. So um, I hate to say lesser of two evils. I mean, can't we have, you know, they're talking about um, Secretary of State. I mean, I get that's not military, but it's still important. Can we get somebody that exposed the government was running Al-Qaeda and ISIS like a General Flynn? But UN John Bolton, he was the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the UN John Bolton, also being considered along with Giuliani. The article's up on Infowars.com. Another article, the same communists that attacked us at the uh, abortion clinic protest we had last year, pointing out that most people aborted are black, even though they're 13% of the population. Whether you like abortion or not, we're pointing out that it's racially targeted because we're so racist, we don't want to kill the black people. Uh, communist protesters arrested for assaulting Trump backers in Austin. These are some of the same folks that assaulted us, and you look at them, they look like their souls have been sucked out. This particular guy is the one that goes, I kill my kids. I love killing my kids. When we come back from break, I'm going to play a clip uh, of that sickening evil. But that's what working for evil does to you. I mean, look at these people. And they had folks, though, driving around in brand new Jaguars and Mercedes dropping them off that would drive by them and wave cash in the air. For, I mean, th these are just soulless people, in my opinion. Anthony Frieda, I want to thank you for all the time. I want to spend in the last few minutes with you. I don't know if you want to get into it. It was the most important part of the interview. But I don't know if you want to go there. About what type of stuff you saw behind the scenes uh, with, you know, artists and people, what they were saying about Trump, the false flag stuff you told me about. Yeah, you know, you ain't seen nothing yet, man. I know what they're planning. And it's going to be relentless. False flags, relentless demonization, relentless. Tr they they are dedicated to this narrative that um, anyone who supports Trump is is uh, is a Nazi, is a racist, he hates everybody who is not a white male. Um, now I think that whole paradigm is built on a falsehood, and I think it's easily provable. But they don't care, and they are dedicated to destroying and ripping apart this country. And it's not just, you know, the Soros guys busting, it's real people, they, they, they're they victims, you know, and we have to, we, I think we have to reach out to them. Listen, I'm, I'm a middle of the road guy, I'm not, I'm not partisan, I am like Gerald, you know, political atheist. But what's going on here is racial warfare and what you predicted 10 years ago, I've listened to you a long time. Now, I'll never forget you said, like, you know, this keeps going. It's going to be like a race war on the street. And everybody laughed at you. Like, it's the most absurd notion you could possibly imagine in America. Well, what about this close to that actually happening? So you're always prescient. You see you see trends and you see where they can lead to. And, and nine out of 10 times, you're right. Um, well, Anthony, I appreciate that, but really, it's not me. It's history. It does repeat. It does rhyme. Let's do five more minutes. We have to go. AnthonyFrieda.com. I, I want to come back, though, because I forgot to get to this, and, and get more into what you can tell us behind the scenes with yeah. top artists and what they're planning, false flags against Trump. Again, that's 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 setups, folks. That's frame-ups. We'll be right back in 70 seconds. Thank this is really important. Stay with us. Visit and we got a big report on global government that the New York Times is denying. They must be spending millions of dollars on this ad because it's in the news feeds on InfoWars. I found it on other libertarian and patriot sites. You have to go through these and cut it out. It's, oh, Amy Schumer explains, I'm not leaving the country. It was all a joke. You're dumb. But look at this quote she says of Donald Trump. And they put it up, and it's him talking about how dumb conservatives are, how he's not a conservative, how he hates his constituents from supposedly 20 years ago. We'll put it back on screen. It's a fake news article trimmed out of the newspaper, yellowed paper, meant to deceive you. That's a false flag, folks, and that's what Anthony Frieda, over a year ago, started contacting us with intel. Watch out for this. Watch out for that. They're going to plant racist stuff on you on the web, on the street, and then we saw it happen. And it's, it, it's, it's incredible 
uh, that we're going to start seeing all of this, but it's the underhandedness. So as much as you can tell us, I mean, because, again, you've been on all, most of the major covers in the country. You know these folks. You're there. And the, the type of things they talk about, what they say, what they do, and then what you say to them. Because you said, we ain't seen nothing yet. No, these guys aren't. Um, they're, they're planning to, um, they're doubling down. They're doubling down on the racist thing. And they want to rip this country apart along racial lines, tragically and sadly and, and un unnecessarily. Um, and they're going to do with every trick in the playbook. We, we know the tricks. If you've read Machiavelli or if you, you know, if you, <laughs> Studied Karl Rove, you know all the ways to uh, discredit your enemy and to uh, attribute all the evils in the world to them, and at the same time uh, glorify your your uh, candidate or your position. So you're going to see um, you're going to see falsehoods. We're already seeing it. People write people writing on the street. I love Hitler and Donald Trump, and then it's on it's on uh, you know sixty minutes. I mean, give me a break. It's so obvious. People can't see it. They're blind. Everybody is blind to obvious false flags that are almost at a childish level, a third grade level. Like my son can see through it, who's 12 years old, because because I, I I introduced a concept to him at a very early age. So he sees it. He tells me, yeah, that's a false flag. You know, it's like, it's about education, uh, but but people want to believe things that they're already prejudiced to believe, and they want to discard things uh, that uh, don't, um, you know, uh, reinforce. And that. by the way, almost all of the swastikas on the campuses and all this has turned out are fake, done by people just for more attention. Absolutely, it's fake. It's so it's so obviously it's so patently fake to me. I mean, just look at it. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna draw a swastika. And say, I love Donald Trump, and I want to, you know. But here's another thing that gets me crazy about this whole uh, anti-Semite and he's he's the Ku Klux Klan thing. It's like his daughter and his grandchildren are Orthodox Jews. Okay, he wants to kill them, put them in concentration camps. I have people, friends of mine who are, are Mexican Americans, good people, smart people. They think he's gonna deport all Americans. And they're, and, they're, and they're promoting that idea. They, they think he's going to deport everybody who, if you, you know, you ate a taco, you get deported. I mean, it's crazy. You know, it's like. It's and then CNN comes out this morning, I was watching it, and goes, he needs to call for peace and admit he's not doing all this to make everybody feel better and not be scared when they're the ones that need to admit they lied. Yeah, it's really, you know, listen, if, if I can, if I can give the best piece of advice I give to, you know, to this, I, I gotta say, I'm an objective person. I'm trying to look at this objectively, but okay, they're calling uh, the Trump supporters racist and deplorable. You know, Hillary broke the cardinal rule of politics. You, you can attack your opponent, but don't attack his supporters because if you win, that's your constituency. You just, you just, and if, and guess what? You're not going to win because you just alienated all of them. They're never going to come to your side. So I, th I really think that's where Hillary blew it, despite the fact that she's a lying, warmongering, corrupt, horrible human being. Uh, the fact that she attacked Trump supporters and not just Trump was incredibly damaging. It showed her. her arrogance, Anthony, and I agree with you. And, and their arrogance is our biggest asset, AnthonyFrieda.com. Look forward to speaking to you again. Thanks for your great work. Thank you, Alex. One of the top artists in the country, Anthony Frieda. I'm Alex Jones, and this is the Info War. It took a lot of courage for him to come on in the business he's in, but that's what makes this country great, is people's courage to basically look at all different angles. Stay with us. Now, we've seen a lot of stonewalling by corporate establishment globalist media. We've seen them deny there were death panels in Obamacare, or that there was an IRS enforcement arm, even though it said there was, and that they would get up to $5,000 fines. If you didn't get Obamacare, they said, if you liked your doctor, you could keep it. It was all in the bill. You couldn't. But they counted on their constituents not going and reading the legislation. But now they're being hit by the legislation, and some polls have it at 87% unpopularity. But the Supreme Court said that it could be a tax paid to multinational corporations. And one year after its implementation, the Wall Street Journal reported a 47-plus percent increase in insurance profitability worldwide just on the milking of America. Now, if that isn't globalism, I don't, what, I don't know what is. I mean, take not the milking, but the bleeding of America 
with a $100 trillion global carbon tax called for in Davos, Switzerland five years ago and published in the BBC, the London Telegraph, you name it. Go look it up, the headline. Davos wants $100 trillion in new taxes every decade. The main funding mechanism, a carbon tax. A global government with $100 trillion every decade. That's to start $10 trillion a year. And Tobin taxes, currency taxes, wellhead taxes. All of this, the brainchild of Ken Lay and Enron and, and, and Al Gore and Lord Rothschild, where they own the carbon trading companies. Obama's heavily invested. And we thought the Clinton Foundation was corrupt. That's what globalism is, is big corporations above the law establishing a corporate system where they're tax exempt. And Trump is exposing that. He's our champion just in what he said. Now, we'll see if he delivers on it. But already they say the TPP is close to dead, maybe playing possum, but Trump wants to go after it. He's already looking at how to take the restrictions off our power plants that were never passed by Congress, but Obama signed on to. He also has detente with Russia right now to take out ISIS. That meeting with Putin happened yesterday. We went from defense condition three to defense condition five, the lowest threat level. So good things are happening. But they're coming after him because Stephen Bannon is an anti-globalist. Now, I, I get called by the Washington Post and the New York Times on a weekly basis. I, in about a year, have refused to talk to them. And they'll email us and say, you will not talk to the New York Times? Excuse me? And I said, okay, finally I will because some Trump folks called and said, no, these people want to talk to you. This will be a fair piece. You, you, know, you can clarify things. Go on. I talked to the lady. No peace today. But three other ones with yours truly in it saying Jones believes in an imaginary thing called globalism. Now, that's like saying, I believe the Atlantic Ocean is off the coast of New York City. I mean, it's literally talking to you like you're a three-year-old that's been knocked upside the head with a tire iron. Globalism, New York Times by Liam Stack. A far-right conspiracy theory buoyed by Trump. Globalism, globalism. And then they actually go through it and find scratchy clips from me years ago to make it look unprofessional. And then they've got some, you know, college student as well talking about globalism and, 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 and world government and saying it's a corporate thing. And they have a huge, this was, I was told, in the physical paper as well. They had two other ones. Where'd the idea come from? They asked, where did we get this theory? Now, William F. Jasper, the editor of the American Magazine, will be with us for the rest of the hour. I wanted to put together, though, a little clip today. This is just what we put together today. It's so about a four and a half minute clip, and then I got a bunch of news articles after it, of world leaders, the head of the EU, the British Prime Minister, Presidents, Obama. I mean, Obama just two months ago said we should give up our freedom of action to the UN. I mean, that means like putting handcuffs on and getting in the truck with Tim, you know, Ted Bundy. But there's this paradox where they still keep denying it. So I wanted to ask William F. Jasper where he sees this going, because... They're discredited. They've lost almost all their readers and viewers because of these activities, but they're only doubling down. I guess where we can never have a real debate about it. Because if they do call Al Gore before Congress, they'll just say there's no carbon tax. I mean, they, you know, they play these weird gotcha games that are just so bizarre. I don't know what the tactic even is at this point. Thank God they're still doing it because it's what's discrediting them. They have all these articles about how Alex Jones and Stephen Bannon are these big racists and never a clip, never a quote. They just say it. So is, are they the only ones buying their propaganda? Let's play this compilation. Then we're going to go to Mr. Jasper to lay out the history of world government, what's being established, because that's what the system of globalism is. But I thought they could, could deny global government or global governance, the system of global government. And it's in and, and its operating system, but to deny globalism, which they push as the new system for 30, 40 years. I mean, this is taught everywhere. This is like denying the Republican Party exists or the George Washington or, 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 or historical things existed. So here is the compilation. We'll go to Mr. Jasper. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, 
we have a real chance at this new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. It is a big idea, a new world order, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. After 1989, President Bush kept and said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think, only once and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. So that the problem of the Bush presidency will be the emergence of a new international order. Within the next four years, we will see the emergence of a new international the beginning, order. The beginning of a new international order. The pieces are in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder this world around us. I think its task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity and it isn't just a crisis. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. There's a need for a new world order, but it has different characteristics in different parts of the, of the world. But today, with Asia already outproducing Europe, India and China are clearly becoming part of our new order. We are now facing a common challenge. And the challenge is how to build a world order for the first time in history on a global basis. So, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, a new world is emerging. It is a new world order with significantly different and radically new challenges. The affirmative task we have now is, uh, is to actually um, uh, create uh, uh, a new world order. Good evening, everybody. President Obama and British Prime Minister Gordon today calling for a new world order to tackle our global economic crisis. And the president outlined his vision of a new world order in which the U.S. would participate fully. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. So I see a uh, world order in the future with a multipolar uh, world order. I think a new world order is emerging and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. But in a globalized economy, we are going to have to take global responsibilities and there going to, is going to have to be some several semblance of global governance. Never before has a new world order had to be assembled from so many different perceptions or on so global a scale. Nor has any previous order had to combine the attributes of the historic balance of power system with global democratic opinion and the exploding technology of the contemporary period. And I surely believe India will be a central actor in the new world order. There also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society. 2009 is also the first year of global governance with the establishment of the G20 in the middle of the financial crisis. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. New World Order is the headline in the Globe and Mail in Canada. Is this global governance at last? Is it one world, the central bankers in charge? But aren't we all just living and dying for what the central banks do? Of course we are. We are absolutely Absolutely slaves to central banks. And then the articles, another new world order. Major papers announcing world government, Reuters, banks face new world order consolidation. But the really big video I'm going to do soon is a compilation of them saying global government, world government, new world order, a map. And then they describe it as this corporately run system with global corporate taxes. Uh, Henry Kissinger again outlines this is a planetary government with global governance are the terms you want to search. Global governance. Global government. Those are the videos we're going to put together later for you uh, with that specific clip over and over again as well. Uh, but we showed a few of those clips. Uh, is it fact or fiction? U.S. media says the New World Order is in jeopardy with Trump. And it goes on and on how they're establishing this corporate world government. 
The bankers at Davos call it uh, a technocracy moving to a form of corporate government run by global elites. Yes, New World Order pushes back on Brexit revolution. Sovereign nations trying to get out of the EU. Huge mega states taking over and conquering. But if you say any of this exists, you're insane. If you go read the Financial Times of London where they actually say, the, the big headline that we want to show folks, and now for global government, Financial Times of London, we'll put that on screen for you. In fact, I'm going to just be here for the next hour while Jasper talks. I'm going to be putting headlines on screen for everybody, so get ready for you to see all those for yourself. Uh, Mr. Jasper, uh, there's just so much proof of this. They're here just denying it, like they did back, uh, you know, back in the 60s and things. It's, but now it's here. There's the Financial Times of London, and now for world government. He announces, yes, you're dumb. Yes, we're authoritarian. Yes, we know best. That's the foreign editor for the Financial Times. They admit all of this now. But then the, 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 the New York Times just unextricably just says, what is this, Mr. Jones? What's this word globalism? We've never heard of it. And talks to their viewers like, what's this thing called Washington, D.C.? These weirdos believe there's a place on Pennsylvania Avenue called a Capitol or a White House I, I mean, what's the tactic here, Mr. Jasper? This bald-faced denial you're talking about here, it is it's very ridiculous. It's absurd. It's difficult to figure out exactly what they're trying to do here. Uh, because as you pointed out, and as we've been pointing out at The New American, I mean, my, my book, uh, uh, Global Tyranny Step-by-Step, Step, the subtitle is the, the United Nations and the Emerging New World Order, and it's replete with quotes taken from newspaper articles, from books, whole books uh, dedicated to the New World Order by globalists themselves, people who identify themselves as globalists, who are for the New World Order, the Kissingers, the Brent Scowcrofts, the Zbigniew Brzezinski's, uh, George Soros, who, who recently... Trump last... Talbot, the, the, uh, the Newsweek editors uh, who, who work for the Clintons, he okay. said national sovereignty is going to be abolished. Right, and, and this, is a, this is a very key thing. When they start talking about globalism, they try to soften it by talking about, well, we're talking about globalization and about increased trade and cooperation among nations. No, they're not talking about cooperation. They're talking about coercion, of building global governance, global institutions that will have world power, legislative, executive, judicial power, military and police power to override nation states, to destroy... First of all, to erode and then destroy uh, national sovereignty. They do not want a United States with a constitutionally limited government being able to uh, in any way resist their, their plans for global governance, which is total takeover of the financial, political, uh, educational, all, all systems, everything that we uh, rely on as part of our culture and our economy and our government. Uh, they want that to be all under global controls. Uh, they cannot uh, allow us to continue running our own lives. And that's what national sovereignty, of course, is all about. And so you see Richard Haas, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Henry Kissinger, constantly attacking national sovereignty. And they say, as President Obama uh, said in this recent article that you referred to in the New York Times, that, uh, oh, we saw World War I and World War II, uh, all of the, the death and destruction that, it, that those conflicts brought to the continent of Europe and to all of the world. It was the result of nations failing to cooperate. And he said, we don't want to see a, re a repetition of that. That is the theme of the false narrative that has been given to us in our textbooks and by our world leaders, uh, globalists, for the last uh, several generations. And, of course, uh, that, isn't, that isn't true at all. The, the World War I and World War II were actually initiated by the globalists to actually... And by the way, that's not your opinion. Um, Lord Milner, what, by 1920 or so, wrote articles in the newspapers admitting they orchestrated it, uh, admitting that they were going to bring in a planetary government for the British Empire out of this. We're not blaming the British, but that's the model that's been used. I mean, here's Obama today in Greece, Obama on Trump's election. We have to guard against a rise in a crude sort of nationalism. Oh, see, us having our own country is crude. It's racist. Uh, and then I've got other ones here where he said two months ago, while he was uh, at the UN, 
that we need to go ahead and seed our mobility. We need to seed uh, our own power for action. We need to give our sovereignty over. Uh, and that he, quote, has problems with backward Americans not letting him do this. I mean, this is so arrogant. Well, and this is where uh, we see all around us today. We see it particularly with the migration and refugee. They call it immigration, but it's migration. Uh, that was set up, again, by the globalists. Uh, we see here in the last... Peter Sutherland admits, the head of the UN's program, the founder of the EU, he took a demotion to run this, that they're going to flood the countries. It came out in WikiLeaks as well, but he's public, and end our sovereignty uh, via conquest by third world populations. Of course, they're not going to get any of the booty, the spoils. They're just using them. Well, and Peter Sutherland, of course, is the ultimate globalist insider. Goldman Sachs, uh, European Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission... Bilderberg, all of the the organizations, the globalist New World Order organizations that the establishment media says don't exist or are benign, inconsequential, uh, social mingling groups. And uh, Peter Sutherland and George Soros with his uh, uh, International Migration Institute uh, were the ones that put this together. And of course, George Soros uh, last year said that the new world order has to feature China as the center of communist China as the center of the new world order. And that's, of course, what uh, these insiders have been building for the last couple of and generations. And look at this London Telegraph article from uh, 2009. There'll be nowhere to run from the new world order. Global thinking won't necessarily solve the world's problems, says. And then it just goes on. Like, you must accept it. You must let us run your country. And then we see all these big top bankers end up getting installed now as prime ministers, ending votes in some European countries. This is naked authoritarianism. Well, that, that was clearly the case in, in Italy, where we saw the Mario brothers put in there uh, as head, head of the uh, central bank and as prime minister. And we've seen throughout Europe. And in that article that you referred to from the New York Times, they talk about far-right and alt-right uh, extremism, etc. What have we had for the last generation here? All over Europe, we've had members of the Socialist International, the SI, uh, running Europe, and currently today, uh, most of the nations in the United Nations and in the European Union are members of the, the ruling parties, are members of the Socialist International, which traces its back its heritage back probably Communist. to Karl Marx. And Socialist so, so, International was his organization, and they play this game, they go, we're not communists, we're socialists, and it's always filthy rich people that are tax-exempt telling little people you got to give your money to the poor, they really mean to them. Well, and, uh, all of these Socialist International uh, leaders, they're, they're regularly there at all the World Economic Forum gatherings in Davos, Switzerland, at the Bilderberg groups, et cetera. They're mixing with Goldman Sachs and Chase Manhattan Bank and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, et cetera. Uh, so there is this unholy alliance between the heads of these various socialist groups and these NGOs that claim to be working for the working man, for the little people. Uh, but you see they're in bed with and in the penthouses with all of the Wall Street globalists, and that's the way it's been much of this century. And so what we see right now after the elections with all of the uh, riots and demonstrations that are going on all across the country, all of these are synthetic astroturf organizations funded principally by George Soros and his colleagues in the various other tax-exempt foundations, Ford, uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, uh, etc., uh, so uh, today we, we are seeing why back in the 1950s, when the Reese Committee of the House uh, of Representatives was investigating the tax-exempt foundations, it was investigating the Ford Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Endowment principally, but other foundations as well, why that was so important and why the New York Times and all of the media at that time came down on them because... All of this infrastructure was being built at that time, which we now see there are thousands of organizations which receive literally billions of dollars every year to create the impression of popular support for all. That's right. We're talking about a massive astroturf network of people screaming racist, racist. If you don't want foreign banks.
to be stealing trillions from your country uh, with a bunch of globalists meeting in secret with world leaders telling us it doesn't exist. But that whole facade is falling. So where do you see this going next? And I also want to get more into the nuts and bolts with one of the top experts in the world on globalism, William F. Jasper. Yes, we're here uh, uh, talking about imaginary things uh, like Puff the Magic Dragon. No, we're talking about the real structure of the world. The globalists all write books admitting it. We give you footage of it all over the world. And the New York Times tells its readers it doesn't exist, period. Look at some of these headlines on DrudgeReport.com. A lot of this is on Infowars.com. It's easy to find on DrudgeReport.com. UN climate change, action unstoppable. We're just going to do it whether you like it or not, America. Kind of like the UK voted to get out of the EU. They said, oh, we're not letting you. You never voted to get in. We're not letting you out. And we might even have to set up domestic militaries and, and dissolve your national military. That's their new announcement EU-wide is to dissolve nation's militaries that means actually setting up paramilitary dictatorships and bringing in an eu army to occupy france and germany and spain and portugal and england and scotland this is actually in major papers with a straight face our answer is to set up our own militaries and abolish the nation state militaries the regional governors will keep the systems in line fear of this battle station and keep the rest in line i mean this is classic 110 percent tyranny and I talked to the pseudo-intellectuals. I mean, I've had the host of ABC Nightly News here. I showed him six clips of Herman Von Rumping and others and Gordon Brown calling for global governance. And he went, oh, that's another global government they're talking about, not, not the one you're talking about. And he smiled. And, and he wanted to go to dinner. So at dinner, he just admitted it. He says, of course, we know it's all Alex, whatever. I work for you, I work for you, work for you, work for you. It's all just a big joke. Besides, the public's too dumb to ever care. Now, there's the EU leader. Let's play it. Uh, Von Rumpy calls for global government. I've got, I've got a bunch of other clips I want to play, too. But, but uh, in fact, the crew did a great job throwing that quick compilation together, but I'm, I'm, I may not have been clear. New World Order is fine, and articles saying it means world government, but I want to get the clips we've got that a lot of folks don't have from C-SPAN and stuff where they admit what New World Order is, a global corporate government with the supranational dominance of international bankers over it. That's what Barry Goldwater <coughs> said it was back in the 60s. Now we know that's the plan. But look at this. Chicago will be a sanctuary city no matter what the feds say. LAPD chief, we won't deport. Boston, we will not cooperate with immigration officials. And that means, when they talk about it, that means with felons. That means with criminals. That means with drunk drivers, murderers, arsonists, rapists. That's what Trump always talked about. Then they turn around to, he wants to deport people's parents and leave their kids here all alone. Never said any of that. That's weird. I've never seen my uh, laptop do that. That's something interesting. That's kind of cool. You guys might want to come in here and get this. I was just uh, showing people that. Think about all the stuff that's wired into these. It's like one of those EAS alert systems they've got uh, that's all wired into everything. And all our appliances, all wired into Big Brother. I'm sure that was just a little malfunction. But the point is, it's in the news today where they're going to have all the drones in America wired into a central system run by the NSA and controlled by AT&T and NASA to build national drone tracking system. Isn't it all special? And they call their global governance management system a technocracy where a group of Technocrats, international bankers, in their own words, read Davos. In fact, Google, Davos says technocrats to run the world. And implanted processors in all devices will make sure you comply. We're going to go back to our guests in a moment, but since we mentioned it, here's the president two months ago saying we should cede sovereignty to the U.N. for our security. Not that barbarous nationalism that he was just talking about today. Here it is. And we can only realize the promise of this institution's founding to replace the ravages of war with cooperation if powerful nations like my own accept constraints. Sometimes I'm criticized in my own country for professing a belief in international norms and multilateral institutions, but I am convinced that in the long run giving up some freedom of action, not giving up our ability to protect ourselves or pursue our core interests, but binding ourselves to international rules over the long term enhances our security. While you run around turning jihadis loose and breaking all those own same rules, 
And notice, international groups like the secret TPP and the secret WTO and all these secret groups and groups you've never heard of, the OECD coming and overseeing our elections and the UN. Oh, and the UN telling our police what to do, and they're not stopping because their whole investment is on this. So is Trump for real? The fact that he raised all these topics is irrevocably damaging. The internal emails admit they hate him. They don't like him. Now, the question is, was he just coming in to take over this whole thing from him? The true alpha goblin? Or is he really trying to restore the republic? I, 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 mean, I think he's for real. I mean, do you think he'd really be calling me last week and calling me other times? I'm just going to stop right there. And I know Donald Trump Jr. For, for, for a fax, a big listener. I mean, Trump isn't out to get the country. I'm going to ask Jasper this question in a moment. But first, one more clip. Here's another clip. This is today in Greece. Obama, very slowly, very methodically, talking about the crude nationalism and just how terrible it is that we don't want to have China with energy three times cheaper than ours because we shut off all of our coal plants or we don't want to have China with lower tariffs than us so that we can't compete. You know, simple stuff like, hey, we don't want to be screwed over. Here it is. I do believe, separate and apart from any particular election uh, or movement, that we are going to have to guard against a rise in... A crude sort of nationalism or ethnic identity or tribalism that is built around an us and a them. All they do is push that. The leftists are all about what group you're in. And I will never apologize for saying that the future of humanity and the future of the world is going to be defined by what we have in common as opposed to those things that separate us. Sure, when he goes to Africa and says you can't have cars or air conditioning. Conflict. Yeah. Everybody better study what globalism is. Everybody better find out it means deindustrialization, enslavement, eugenics, total control. Everyone should see my film, Endgame, Blueprint for Global Enslavement. It's free online. Send it to everybody you know. It was made nine years ago. You watch it, you go, this all came true. How'd you know this? Because they all write textbooks and white papers to each other. They think you're too dumb to look at it. So that said, William F. Jasper, New American Magazine. We'll give out that URL and put that on screen for folks as well the new america.com paul watson's gonna be hosting in about 25 minutes uh the fourth hour with big breaking news from london the new american.com people should subscribe you can buy the magazine i know in bulk at cost to give to folks great films great books great material uh super dead on uh in fact sometimes not behind the curve but you know they're they're, they're so conservative sometimes they you know wait a while uh, which is fine the point is it's really good material uh to get out to folks and just to let people know about the real world. So, so, so we played all those clips, and we can tackle any area you want. But I mean, where should we go? What is global governance? What do first, they want to do with this global all, governance? Uh, how do we stop them? It, it was very interesting that that President Obama in that first clip that you played there said, you know, well, we we have to accept constraints. But you notice he is not willing to accept the constraints which he took an oath to uh, take on as President of the United States. Our Constitution puts restraints and constraints on him and on all members of our government, on the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. However, they are claiming a higher calling to put constraints on us, on we the people, on our national independence and sovereignty. And that is, that is one of the, the real big uh, crimes that's taking place here. He and his fellow globalists are uh, claiming this righteousness about trying to uh, bring about world peace, which is what they have been using since the uh, launch of the United Nations. You well, know, since the, the League of Nations, as you said earlier. Since the League of Nations, even before their, their first big try at world order. And in fact, uh, one of the books that I cite in, in, uh, in my book, Global Tyranny, and my other one, The United Nations, is the third try at world order. The first try was the League of Nations, second try was the uh, uh, United Nations, and the third try is now to make the United Nations the full uh, world government that was intended by those founders that both George Bush, George H.W. Bush, and President Obama referred to. Sure, so we've to documented so it's happening. How is it going for them? How does Trump figure in? Uh, I mean, well, this is... 
this is this is going to be very interesting and and all of us uh who are very hopeful for uh mr trump now president-elect trump are going to have to watch very carefully and we have to see first of all who is he going to appoint and uh you know there it, it, it's obvious that as president he has to try, try to mend some fences uh and he's reaching out to some people that many of us are very suspicious of uh, the Paul Ryan's and the Rince Priestesses and others who have been part of the Republican establishment that has been selling us out for uh, decades. Uh, can they be worked with? Well, he has to work with them to a degree. But uh, what we have to really be concerned about is if we start seeing members of the globalist establishment, the Council on Foreign Relations, trilateral commissioners uh, showing up. Uh, That's right. He better not appoint Richard and Haas. Yes. Well, that was his his dropping of that uh, possibility in one of his early uh, interviews with Brett Baer of Fox when he was asked who would uh, he view as a as a good uh, foreign policy advisor, and he mentioned Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And I don't really know what uh, uh, drove him to make that. Uh, well, by the way, he ended up meeting with him because I'll tell you, Trump's really smart, but he doesn't know all this stuff. He doesn't get online. He only reads newspapers. He is a nationalist, but I'll be honest, he's super smart at what he knows at 70. But he's got some gray areas and, and some blacked out areas. Well, and like that's the understandable, too. He's a, he's a businessman. He's been very active in a lot of things. And without trying to make excuses, I've told people, well, uh, you know, we have to... We'll have to watch and see. But let me just give you a very quick uh, uh, scenario that actually played out a number of years ago. You remember in 1980 when uh, Ronald Reagan was running against George Bush in the primary. Yes. And going into the New Hampshire primary, this is 1980, uh, George Bush uh, was outed as a member of the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, and putting all these trilateralists in his entourage. And so the Reagan administration uh, knocked him on that. Well, I got a call from uh, the Reagan campaign. I got a call from the Reagan campaign uh, from a, a congressman who was one of his top advisors, a good congressman, John Russolo, who was my congressman in California. And the congressman Russolo called and he said, is it true that George Bush is a member of the of the Trilateral Commission? And I said, uh, yes, it is. And he said, well, how do you know that? And I said, well, because I have a copy of their membership list. This is pre pre internet, you know. So <laughs> this stuff. Let was me not stop you. You steal my thunder. This was so incredible. In the seventies and eighties, even early nineties, they knew there wasn't an internet, so they would get on TV. We have the clips. We've actually sent off to CBS and got them for films we made and NBC. They would go. They claim there's a group called the Trilateral Commission and that it does things. They would again deny it even existed where you had congressmen having to call you wanting to see a faxed proof so they could show it to George Herbert Walker. I mean, that's the levels we've come from. Please continue. Uh, absolutely. And so and, and so he said, well, how do you know it's a real list? And I said, well, it's it was published by them. I, I picked it up at their office in New York. He says, they have an office in New York? I said, yes, I was there. <laughs> I have a copy of it. I said, he said, well, can you get it to us? So I did. I, I, at that time, even fax machines were a rarity. They had telefax machines that spun around. Sure, you I remember to you told me the story like 15 years ago. That's why I remembered it. Yeah. And, and so I, I uh, faxed it off to him. And so then they made a speech for Reagan in which he denounced the, the Trilateral Commission, globalism, et cetera. And that was... Uh, and that's the uh, TV clip we sent off and got was Reagan giving that speech that almost nobody has. And then the whole media freaking out, uh, going, well, the Trilateral Commission just wants countries to work together. So they had to admit because the candidate finally talked about it that it existed. And then what happened? So immediately after he is elected, we have George Bush and all the trilateralists and Council on Foreign Relations members being appointed to his cabinet. And so what that showed at the time, and in fact, uh, even as we were reporting on President Reagan attacking the Trilateral Commission, we were cautioning people saying, but he has all of these advisors in his entourage that look like they're going to go that direction themselves. And that's what happened after he was elected. He put George Bush and all of the trilaterals in and all of the conservatives who had worked to elect him were 
on the outside. Exactly. So let's talk about that briefly. Let's talk about that because we're about to go to break. I, I mean, I think Trump's even more of a maverick than Reagan, but clearly that because they're so much more afraid of him. But but yes, here's what they're doing to Trump, and they admit they're doing this. They're panicked, and, and they haven't done it. They go, there's 4,000 people. No one's going to age you. They're claiming he didn't even know that he didn't keep the White House staff. No, he, he knew. The point is, is that they panic you and say, no one's going to work with you if you don't put people in from the establishment. And then what's a president do when the bureaucracy, the fourth, the fifth of state, holds you hostage? And, and it's almost like air traffic controllers going on strike. What do you do then? Because that's how they get presidents like Reagan and now Trump to roll over. Well, that, and that's true. They have, uh, we have allowed them over the last 50, 60, 70 years, actually going uh, clear back to FDR, to World War II, they have controlled and have become the shadow government. And so it is very difficult for anyone coming in to be able to break through that. And that's what Ron Paul said two days ago. He said, hey, Trump may be a great guy, but the shadow government's going to completely ignore him. You will, they will sabotage him at every level. And so the one, the one advantage, well, a number of advantages that uh, Trump has that Reagan did not. And that is uh, he, Reagan may have believed in all of his ideology that he had been uh, uh, spewing out for, for a long time. I don't know. He, uh, but he was certainly a, a, a man who allowed uh, those around him to, to run him and control him. Uh, Trump is a much different uh, personality. And that's why they're scared of him. He's done everything on his own. He's known exactly for doing pig-headedly whatever he wants. That, that's well, what's gonna... he, is, he is independently wealthy. He, he is not reliant upon them. He can do things outside of the box that other people can't. And so it's going to be very t tough for them if they can't uh, sabotage him and, and get him to bend to go into their box. Uh, the next thing, we and we talked about this before, is that uh, they will be looking for ways to get rid of him. And uh, this is where he has to be very careful, literally, for his for his safety. And, and also find one of his underlings does something corrupt. He doesn't know about it. The underling rolls. They impeach him. I mean, they're coming after him. Sure. I, so this is going to be very dirty. Uh, I had a number of, of uh, people that I helped uh, uh, work for to get into Congress. Uh, back in the that time when Newt Gingrich went in, the contract with America, and they all said, yes, they were going to fight against him. They would not. I said, well, you really have to appoint good people to your staff because the, the Republican establishment will come to you and say, you need to have our people in there. And all four of the people that swore to me they were going to put good people in ended up Taking all of the because that's that. how it works. You just get there, and it's so complex. You say, what do you do? When we come back, with key info. I'm going to cut a video today and reach out to all the anti-Trump people and just say, listen, it's like you're the victim of a Nigerian email scam or the victim of you know, any other type of scam. I, it really hurts me seeing you get conned. I want you to be in a free market. I want you to have a better shot. I don't want a permanent underclass. I don't get off. So many elitists get off on poor areas and people downtrodden, and it makes them feel good. You see a lot of fake middle class people have a nice car and a nice house, and they, they look down on everybody as well. When I see people down and out, it makes me feel bad. And I guess call me a bleeding heart, whatever. I mean, my parents, I, when I was a kid, I was like, can we please not spend Christmas Eve or Christmas Day at the, at the Salvation Army in downtown Dallas with a bunch of hobos with crap running down their legs? And my parents would say, that's why you're lucky that we're upper middle class and have things good. This is what life's like. Now let's go to the hospital and visit paralyzed children. And I guess I need to do that to my kids because they're great, but they're spoiled compared to the way I was. Quite frankly, I'm not down there at the homeless shelters. I mean, I do stuff like Meals on Wheels and stuff. But I think so much of this is most of the protesters that got arrested in Portland turned out didn't even vote. And it turned out they were hired, folks, of course. And they're so racist. They're so dumb. I got to be honest. I don't know if you can help them because I've been around the KKK protesting them and stuff. It's the exact same trashy scumminess that I see in those white people. I see in the white people, black people, and Hispanics that are out lying about Trump. And they're going to try to discredit the nationalist movement saying it's racist to have a nation and not be run by foreign banks. It's a joke. We all shouldn't want to be run by the most ruthless banks in the world. William F. Jasper, New American Magazine.
Uh, I believe that we're coming from behind. I believe we have a chance to win. We have a beachhead in Washington. Trump's already discredited the media, the pollsters, the system. This is my secret weapon, and I have the numbers here. Let me pull them up. Like, where'd my phone go? I had it earlier. That huge amounts in the Senate, the House, a bunch of governors, 900-plus seats, legislator movement. If we jump on the Trump bandwagon, which we created, and just get our people in on nationalism behind him the next two years, not even hoping he does the right thing, I hope he does, I, I think what you were getting at is checkmate to make sure we get enough patriots in that understand the real paradigm that it will then be game over no matter what comes in the future. Don't you think that's probably the best time spent? Well, yes, and, and uh, you know everybody focuses on the presidency every four years, and that's an easy thing to do, and it seems like it's a quick fix because we'll just ha hire this one guy on a white horse and he'll come in and fix everything, but it isn't that easy. And, it, and uh, I think most people who have gotten behind Trump realize that, that we have a, a, a huge, huge uh, challenge ahead of us, and it's coming at us uh, in many different ways, economically, uh, uh, militarily. Our military has been hollowed out, our, our manufacturing base, all of these things. We can do, uh, we can make some major changes in those things, but uh, unless we get some help at the congressional level and at the state legislatures and the governorships, et cetera, our local government, uh, and this is where I hope that uh, President Trump will be uh, visionary in uh, helping uh, to build the base here. I agree. That's the real move. And uh, under President Obama, Democrats have lost 900 state legislature seats, 12 governors, 69 House seats, 13 Senate seats. That's some legacy. Uh, I mean, doesn't this then, William F. Jasper, isn't this the biggest repudiation of globalism ever with Brexit, with Russia pulling out of it? I mean, I would say we're on the march. The empire's on the run. Well, it, the, the Brexit was a, was a huge, huge thing. We talked about that uh, the last time. And uh, this is where it was quite delicious to, uh, to watch the major media, all of the establishment uh, globalists, uh, just going into meltdown mode over the Brexit uh, loss and now doing the same thing at, at a magnitude much larger over this, uh, this loss here for them. Uh, their loss is our gain. Uh, so we have to make the, the most of this. Uh, we're in a, a huge battle. We're in a cultural battle, a spiritual battle, an educational battle, financial battle. Uh, and it's it's uh, something that's been building for a long Absolutely. time. Absolutely. We're completely surrounded. That's good. We can attack in all directions. We finally found we can do that. We're winning. Thank you so much, sir. Fourth hour with Paul Watson. Straight ahead. I'm going to come back and finish up. Thank you, Mr. Jasper. Everybody subscribe to the magazine, New American Magazine. I knew their attack would be Trump isn't delivering on everything 65 days before he's in office. And he's, I'm going to trust him until he gets in. I'm already seeing Brexit expanded. I'm already seeing TPP in trouble. Uh, in fact, they say dead. I'm already seeing him say we're going after the carbon taxes. Power plants turn back on. Uh, I'm already seeing massive victories. Supreme Court justices that are going to be patriots. That's my litmus test. If Trump starts going and appointing bad justices that aren't, Strict construction into the Constitution, and the list he put out was pretty darn good. Then I'll be upset. But no, he's delivering. They're scared. They're freaking out. They're they're hitting on all all all, all angles right now. And Lou Dobbs has come out and really warned him: don't get close to Paul Ryan. Now Trump may think he can dominate Paul Ryan, but Paul Ryan's already stabbed him in the back so many times. Uh, Trump's going to wait till Paul Ryan tries to sabotage him again, and then have the House move to remove him. Know that Trump's got to wait till he gets in. He's got 65 days, folks. He's got to sit there while they attack him and, and try to be presidential. So let's, let, let's not let him throw the baby out with the bathwater. Here's Lou Dobbs. Thoughts on a curious direction taken in our national swamp. You know, the one the president-elect promised to drain and a dangerous, dangerous course it seems to be. All is now set to hold House leadership elections tomorrow. Speaker Paul Ryan running unopposed for re-election. This is the same Ryan who was working more closely with President Obama than his own conference, who, dare I mention this, who betrayed his party's nominee for president? Ryan, after all, was on a losing, not winning Republican ticket just four years ago. And he was crushed in a debate that year by none other than Joe Biden. This is the same overfull Hamlet who took a month to endorse Trump after he became the 
presumptive nominee who said he had a, quote, obligation to call out Trump. He slammed Trump, attacked his immigration proposals. Ryan criticized and deferred and never once advocated for Trump. It was one week ago, last Monday, that he said to a radio talk show host, quote, no one person controls this party, when he should have been speaking for the top of the ticket. And I think it's clear Ryan believed Trump would lose the election. Ryan kept waving his silly better way agenda pamphlet around. Not, not the Trump uh, proposals, not the party's platform. Ryan reminds me of the story Trump told throughout his campaign. Snake. He quoted the poem about a woman taking in an ailing snake. Now she stroked his pretty skin and then she kissed him and held him tight. But instead of saying thank you, that snake gave her a vicious bite. Oh, shut up, silly woman, said the reptile with a grin. You knew damn well I was a snake. You knew everything about me before you took me in. And indeed we do. Ryan has made clear to all, to his fellow Republicans, to the nation, what he is, what he's capable of, and who he is, and there's no cure for that. I sure do hope I'm wrong about all this. I just don't have any evidence whatsoever that I am. That's right. The rest of it is up to Ryan. We'll see. That's right. Uh, Trump is playing presidential while they attack him from every angle. Ryan is out sniveling around and attacking him from behind. And Lou Dobbs is the very best broadcaster journalist in the media today. The, hands down, for just being a journalist and a broadcaster for smarts, it's Lou Dobbs. He's a big listener. Fox doesn't let him come on the show. I'll just tell you that. Uh, I guess Tucker Carlson got in trouble for coming on. They said, don't do that anymore. Like, like, like I need them on the show. I'm trying to support good people on your on your platform, they're trying to purge Napolitano. People like Lou Dobbs, they put them over on the business channel. Uh, the, you know, this is what they do. And, and, and I'm telling you, those guys ever get their own platform like this. I mean, if those guys had a platform like this, they'd be as big as I am. Maybe I should fly them down here sometime and just show them how big we are with the actual numbers. I'm like, hey, that was 85 million viewers last week. What do you think about that? That's a lot bigger than Fox, isn't it? And they'd be like, whoa, how is that possible? I know, it's all Emperor's New Clothes. It's all just fantasy land. We've already won, folks. Why do you think nationalism is sweeping the world? It's because of DrudgeReport.com and InfoWars.com and Breitbart.com and Paul Watson. Paul was just telling me about a remix of my uh, Goblin rant that's got 10 million views on one platform, 2 million on another. And, and the reason I raise this is they, they originally do these videos to make fun of me. And then fans pick it up and go further with it. And then we're finding some of our biggest metrics for young people tuning in are the pieces meant to hurt us. So that's the old Bible verse about no weapon formed against us to prosper. We're going to go to Paul Watson and turn this over to him uh, just in a moment, though, after a music segue. He's got a big show lined up for you today, and then he's got his girlfriend there in a rub waiting for as soon as he's over. That's kind of politically incorrect, a man with a woman, but that's all coming up a little bit later on the behind-the-scenes footage. But uh, solutions from, look at Paul smiling over there. Look, there he is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> just swing the camera over for everyone. <laughs> We're going back to you in just a minute. But first... Solutions from Science, an incredible sponsor. They're one of my oldest sponsors, and they're selling some of their perfect power solar generators below cost. This is their top-of-the-line model, the one I use at my house. It's expandable, so you can make it as powerful as you want. Normally, around $6,000. They're letting them go for $1,500. They've never, I bought one for like $4,000. These are upgraded units. Visit PowerGridChaos.com. It's PowerGridChaos.com. And get yours before they're gone. And finally, we're about to sell out a limited edition uh, Trump is my president on the front, Infowars.com, legalized freedom on the back. When it's gone, it's gone. We've got new shirts that are being produced right now that will be coming out next week. But this is the newest, latest edition. It's, we've only had it for, what, three weeks, and uh, it will be gone when this fourth week is over. So get that. Um, while supplies last, some sizes, I'm told, like large, are about to sell out. The most common size large uh, is, uh, or I guess extra large, is already sold out. So we have... We have Large XXL and stuff like that. So one size is already, I guess, gone away, or maybe I'm wrong. I, I saw it there, but uh, that's available at InfoWarsStore.com at cost. Shipping included, nine ninety five. The shirt costs five bucks. The shipping's about five bucks. So uh, it is all there. Is that me, or is there no extra large there? Is that a malfunction in there? Because they told me they're about to sell out. I guess they've already sold out of some sizes. 
But, but before we get to Paul and all this serious news, since he mentioned this to me during the break and asked if I'd seen it, I have. My kids demand to see it at least five times a day. In fact, I think I'm going to make my new alarm clock jingle uh, this every morning. I'm serious. Uh, here it is. I don't want to see him kissing goblins, ingratiating goblins, in bed with a goblin. I don't want to see him kissing goblins, succubus with goblins, ingratiating goblins, in bed with a goblin. I don't want to see him kissing goblins, goblins, ingratiating goblins, in bed with a goblin. I don't want to see him kissing goblins, ingratiating goblins, in bed with a goblin. Dump it. Charging into a goblin's nest of goblin vomit and slopping blood on it. Especially up to his ankles. Trump charging into a goblin's nest of goblin vomit and slopping blood. Goblin vomit and slopping I'm not expecting him to not get dirty slop. Seeing goblins. Seeing goblins. Seeing goblins. Give us with goblins. Give us with goblins. Bad with a goblin. Bad with a goblin. Seeing goblins. Seeing goblins. Seeing goblins. Seeing goblins. I just want to catch him in bed, 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 bed with a cop, in 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 bed with a cop, I just want to catch him in bed with a cop, in bed with a cop, in bed with a cop, in bed with a cop. Then they catch inside the cave at Hillary's headquarters uh, the goblins that are into uh, Kenny Parr and everything else, and we're not even joking. All right, let's not see her at the end. We've already seen over Hillary. Paul, I wanted I didn't cover this properly like I should have today. And let's let's cover this first, then I'm gonna let you get out of here. In fact, I'm gonna just punch you out. First off, congratulations on all that's happening. Uh, Hillary Clinton became physically violent after she realized she had lost the election, began attacking people, had to be restrained, but she couldn't come out that night, and John Podesta had to do it. I want you to briefly speak to your top story on Infowars.com today that really should go viral just to show how unstable she is. This is what Secret Service before said she would do. We've had some of them on the broadcast, but separately, that whole joke video is about I don't care if he has goblin guides to go into the, you know, Washington. I don't care if he gets goblin guts on him. But if he catch him kissing goblins or in bed with a goblin, uh, you know, that's a problem. Or what if he marries a goblin? What if he has babies with a goblin? I mean, that would be what Hillary did. No, I mean, that's the point. He's going to be around a lot of goblins, but he just has to avoid becoming a goblin himself. The funny thing about that channel, the guy who made that is actually a big fan of ours. And... His other videos are all hilarious as well. I post them every time he uploads them. Called Place Boying, because that's a really good YouTube channel. I can channel. tell he's a fan. I'm saying originally, though, Gawker attacked us with it. Oh, no, of course. But then he takes it and reverses it and twists it. But some of the other stuff on his channel is really avant-garde and funny, and people should go and check it out. There it is, Place Boying, on YouTube. Absolutely. Well, well, that's my whole point, is they try to attack us. They seem so disconnected. They don't understand... When the whole media attacks somebody now or twists stuff, it just makes everybody come to that spot because they're so discredited. No, I mean, Alex, the first thing that happened to me this morning, the first thing I saw on the internet was Mashable.com, which is a pretty big website, said that, quote, I advocated for mass murder in the aftermath of the election. So they took one of my tweets where it was somebody saying, oh, Donald Trump is going to gas all the disabled people like Hitler did. They were serious when they made that tweet. I made a joke about it, posted it, and said, oh, look, Donald Trump's going to gas all disabled people. They took me quoting that joke tweet and said that I advocated for mass murder in the aftermath of this election. You can see the article up on screen now. They've put a retraction at the end of it and changed the article after I basically said that was libelous. But again, incredibly sloppy journalism. They're saying that we're hateful, we're advocating for mass murder. Trump's on CBS saying... Oh, are you going to apologize on behalf of your supporters mistreating Latinos and Muslims? Meanwhile, Trump supporters are out on the streets getting beaten to a pulp. You know, the death threats are through the roof. All the hate crimes are against Trump supporters, whereas they've invented this hoax that Trump supporters are engaging in hate crimes. And that's the debunked discredit. And they're desperate when you're, when you're linking to somebody's tweet about them saying this is a joke. They're saying that's what you actually stand for. Take Amy Schumer. We exposed on Saturday. Our videos had like 600,000 views. The article's been read over a half million times. Showing a fake headline where she said he hates his constituents and hates Republicans. They're not even retracting it. They admit it's fake. They just put fake lies out. So this is the next level. Paul, I'm going to punch out. Folks want to hear you. Appreciate everything. Uh, this is a big success, though. Uh, please also give us your views on whether you think he's beginning to kiss goblins, goblins vomit, catch him in bed with a goblin. 
Okay, thanks, Alex. Yeah, the contract with America that Trump posted, you know, before the election, before the process even took place, most of the things in that contract for America can't even begin to take place until he actually takes office. So for now, what is it, less than a week after he's actually president-elect? For people to be saying that he's backtracking on everything he said is ridiculous. Of course, the language is going to be more conciliatory than it was in the lead-up to the election, because you've got thousands of maniacal Hillary supporters out on the streets rioting and attacking people. We had another story up on Infowars.com earlier today where there were reports that they actually blocked an ambulance because they were blocking all the highways in numerous different cities. We haven't nailed down exactly where, but that they blocked an ambulance. They had to go around 45-minute extended journey. A father of a four-year-old girl died because that ambulance didn't get to hospital one time because of those Trump supporters blocking the roads and the highways. That's all taking place, but meanwhile, you know, Donald Trump has to apologize for his what his supporters are doing, this hate crime wave that they've begun in the aftermath of the election. And this mirrors exactly what we saw after Brexit. Immediately after the vote, after Brexit won, they claimed that there was a hate crime wave sweeping Britain. The police came out a couple of weeks later and said, well, there's been no actual increase in documented hate crimes. There was an increase in the reporting of hate crimes because the mainstream media went completely hysterical, just like the mainstream media in America, and basically said that anything now constitutes a hate crime. So the mere rumor of a hate crime was incorporated into all these hate crime figures, and then the media claimed that hate crimes were through the roof. Again, we see the exact same process. You've got the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, which of course is a complete Democrat front, completely controlled group, asking people to report so-called hate crimes. Well, I reported a hate crime to the SPLC, a Trump supporter being beaten up by a mob in Chicago because they claimed he supported Trump. They didn't even know that he voted for Trump at the time. Turns out he did. They didn't know that at the time, beating him to a pulp, dragging him in a car, literally looked like a lynching, like you would see happen to black people back, you know, 100 years ago. I reported that as a hate crime because it obviously was. That's why I got put in this, in this Mashable article saying that I advocated mass murder because I'm tweeting a joke tweet. It wasn't even a joke tweet. It was a serious tweet by somebody who said that they were concerned Donald Trump would mass murder disabled people. I tweeted it and said, look, this is hilarious. This person actually thinks this. And then they said that that constituted me, quote, advocating for mass murder in the aftermath of the election. That's not only sloppy journalism, that's libelous. They corrected it within hours after I complained to them and then added a ridiculous uh, retraction at the bottom, which in fact they had to dilute even further. Editors know this is on the Mashable article, alt-right Twitter is emboldened and not going away. This is at the bottom of the article, you can see it there. An earlier version of this story took a tweet from user Paul Joseph Watson out of context. Watson has clarified his views and we regret the error. The story has since been amended. Took it out of context. You said that I was, I was advocating mass murder. I mean, for God's sake, what kind of idiot wrote this article knowing that that's basically all I do on Twitter every day is take the hysterical overreactions of leftists and shine a light on it and shine a mirror on it and say, look, this is ludicrous. Of course, Donald Trump is not going to gas disabled people like Hitler. Then by the time that gets into the mainstream media, I'm advocating mass murder. Well, no, that's completely ridiculous. And that's why nobody trusts you. But again, we'll get into it after the break. They still haven't fully retracted on it. And more big news coming up. This is the Alex Jones Show Live. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. This is the headline up on Mashable.com. They've changed it. They've made the headline more hardcore because they had to water down the article because it was basically libelous. The empowered alt-right trolls have created a cesspit on Twitter. Oh, really? That's funny because whenever I go on Twitter, it's leftists threatening to assassinate Donald Trump. We've posted those tweets many times. In fact, I've just made a video which is literally six minutes solid most of it is death threats posted by leftists on Twitter threatening to assassinate Donald Trump. So the only people, yeah, you're going to have racists in the alt-right. 
But the only people who've actually made Twitter a cesspit, and in fact now Twitter has increased its censorship because of that, the only people who have made Twitter a cesspit is leftists with their violent, hateful, racist threats, which they now specialize in. But this was the original quote on this um, Mashable article. They said, Paul Joseph Watson, the editor-at-large of conspiracy theorist website InfoWars, who has a Twitter following of 345,000 users, it's actually 357,000, he can't even count. This idiot who wrote this article, what's his name? Let's get his name. Colin Daylider, can't even count, for one. Who has a Twitter following of wrong amount of Twitter users, advocated for mass murder in the aftermath of the election. His proof that I advocated for mass murder was me posting a tweet by somebody else who was concerned about mass murder. I said, look, this is silly. Donald Trump is going to gas disabled people. Obviously, a joke. He's not going to gas disabled people. The original tweet was a concern against mass murder. Yet they used it to say that I was encouraging, I was advocating mass murder. This is why no one trusts the mainstream media. This is why you lost. This is why your narrative is failing. This is why you're going out of business, because you lie, you deceive. They since changed it. Let me get the exact quote. They put the retraction at the bottom. They then changed the article to say, Anglin, that's somebody else, Andrew Anglin, is far from the only person who has scoffed at the idea that hate might now be emboldened. Paul Joseph Watson. And then it goes on to say, I shared this tweet. So I'm scoffing at the idea that hate might now be emboldened. Meanwhile, all the real hate is being directed towards Donald Trump and his supporters. We had the video out of Chicago. The Trump voter being attacked, beaten to a pulp, dragged in a vehicle. We had the girl in a high school in California being beaten up by her classmates because she posted some pro-Trump image on Instagram. We've had death threats. In fact, we've had another death threat against Donald Trump today. We've had film directors. We've had other famous people. We've had a CEO of a major company who's had to resign because he directly threatened to kill Donald Trump. Okay? We had hateful, violent behavior towards Donald Trump supporters throughout the entirety of the year, proven to be funded by the DNC as James O'Keefe exposed. But no, none of that is happening. It's me that's emboldening hate because I post a tweet by somebody saying, Donald Trump is going to gas disabled people and say that's ridiculous. Absolutely ludicrous, but what do you expect from the discredited, debunked, rigged mainstream media? Meanwhile, Donald Sutherland says he's, just, he's ashamed of being a white male and has lost all hope after Trump's victory. Let's go to this clip. Helen Mirren came up to me on the set. She said, you are the most privileged person on earth. I said, how can you say that? And she said, you are a white male. Oh, and your reply to that was? Uh, there's no reply. Mm. I was ashamed. Mm. I was stunned. And I have gotten more ashamed. Mm. It's, it's interesting to, to realize that you are seen as an integral part of a group that many of whom are mendacious, misogynist, uh, bigots, racists, and it's appalling. Four grandchildren, what do you tell them to give them a hopeful view How can of I life? give them a hopeful view? Uh, now, how can I give them a hopeful view? I, I have a wife, I have a daughter, I have a daughter-in-law, and a granddaughter. What, what do I say to them? What do I say to them? Their, their women's rights have gone. You know, they, the environment has gone. Uh, uh, minimum pay has gone. What, what do I say to them? How do I, you know, I can only say one thing. I am a Canadian. That's <laughs> Donald Sutherland saying that because Trump's now in office, or isn't even in office yet because he's president-elect, women's rights are gone. Really, has Donald Trump already revoked women's rights to vote? He's saying the environment's gone. Donald Trump's literally already destroyed the earth. It's all over. Give up. But of course, the main theme of that is he's ashamed for being a white male because Helen Mirren told him it was really bad.
again, reinforcing the fact that the last acceptable form of racism is racism against white people. The last acceptable form of bigotry is bigotry against white men. And Donald Sutherland is continuing that ridiculous narrative. We'll be back. Stay tuned. We are live at the fourth hour of the Alex Jones Show. Before we delve back into the news, I want to tell you about some of the great products we have available at InfoWarsLife.com. We have BioPCA, the ultimate new hair, skin and nails formula. For years, listeners have been asking us to create a game-changing formula that works to give your hair, skin and nails the compounds that they really need. No matter how hard we try, every single day we expose ourselves to toxic chemicals that are wreaking havoc on our skin and hair. BioPCA is specifically formulated to help give your hair, skin and nails a healthy appearance and fight back against our toxic environment. And you've heard Anthony Gucciotti and Alex talk about it. We don't settle for second best, and that's why we've got the independent five-star reviews on basically all our products, including BioPCA. We also have the Trump is my president shirt for just $9.95. Again, this is a new T-shirt, but we're making it available for just $9.95. Again, this huge temper tantrum by children across America, grown-up adult babies, whining in their diapers, saying that Donald Trump is not their president. Fight back. Win back that narrative by getting the president-elect Donald Trump t-shirt. Trump is my president for just $9.95. Again, this is a lost leader. We're not making any money on this. But this is, again, to reinforce the message that as we move towards December 19th and this electoral college vote, which they're still trying to derail, believe it or not, this reinforces the message. This wins the narrative. That is the Trump is my president shirt for just $9.95 at InfoWarsStore.com. Let's get back into the news. Before the break, we had Donald Sutherland apologizing for his white guilt, for his skin color, because again, the last acceptable form of racism is racism against white people, and that's supposedly our privilege to be racist, to be made racist every single day merely because of our skin color. We have the privilege to be called racist on a regular basis. Again, bigotry, last acceptable form of bigotry is bigotry against white men. You see that throughout the leftist media. And now we have this video, which is up on uh, AmericanMirror.com. Clinton campaign blames white women for defeat. More bigotry of low expectations from the left. Move over, James Comey. Hillary Clinton's campaign has a new culprit for its loss to Donald Trump. Self-loathing sexist women. During an appearance on MSNBC on Monday, former Clinton campaign communications director Jess McIntosh claimed that it was women with internalized misogyny who couldn't bring themselves to vote to elect the first woman president. Let's go to this clip. And my understanding from my conversations with the Clinton folks, right, is that there's a certain demographic, everyone sort of comes up with their demographic path sure. to victory. And in some ways, the demographic bet was there's going to be some demographics on which she underperforms. Mm -hmm. That will be made up for ones in which she overperforms. Yep. And one of those was uh, women, particularly Republican yeah. women, white women. We should be clear, women of color overwhelmingly voted for her and have overwhelmingly voted for every Democratic yes. presidential candidate. But she, uh, among white women, uh, didn't do any different uh, than essentially Obama in 2012, a point better. Yeah. How do you make sense of that? I mean, internalized misogyny is a real thing, and this is a, a thing that we, we have to be talking about as we go through and see. What does that, that mean, though? My like guess is, it, look, it, the president said it the best during this whole campaign. We, as a society, react poorly to women seeking positions of power. We are uncomfortable by it, and then we seek to justify that, that uncomfortable feeling, because it can't possibly be because we don't want to see a woman in that position of power. We need to, as we, as we go through these numbers, as we figure out exactly what, what happened with turnout. It seems to be white college educated women. My guess is that breaks down married, unmarried. My guess is it breaks down older, younger. Yeah. But we have work to do talking to those women about what happened this year and why, why, would, why we would vote against our self-interests. So again, they're saying that internalized misogyny is because that's the reason why women voted for Trump. Well, now, internalized misogyny really means women being able to think for themselves. They're basically saying that women who don't agree with us, with our narrative, that Hillary Clinton, because she has a vagina, deserves to be the president. They're saying if you don't agree with that, you're weak, you're brainwashed. Again, this is the left's bigotry of low expectations. 
any woman who doesn't carry the can for them, any woman who doesn't buy into their ridiculous debunked narrative, has internalized misogyny. She can't think for herself. And again, the most rampant and hateful misogyny is always, always reserved for conservative and Republican women. Look at how they treated Sarah Palin. Look at how they treat Ann Coulter. The most vile, horrific slurs reserved for women like Ann Coulter because they're conservatives. You know, maybe women who voted for Trump could actually see past your lame cliches about Hillary being this women's rights champion. Have you ever considered for a second that that's why they voted for her? Have you ever considered that they knew that they actually had the mental capacity to do the research and find out that Hillary Clinton laughed at knowing a child molester that she defended was guilty? A man who molested a young girl, 12 years old. Is that the big feminist candidate that all women should have voted for? Or they had mis internalized misogyny? You know, maybe they looked into the fact that 20% of Hillary's campaign was funded by Saudi Arabia, a country that treats women little better than farmyard animals. How's that for your women's rights champion? Maybe they looked into the fact that Bill Clinton got a $1 million birthday check from Qatar, a country in which it's still legal for a husband to beat and rape his wife. That sounds really feminist, doesn't it? Maybe women had the mental capacity to know those facts and that that's why they didn't believe your crap that Hillary Clinton was the feminist candidate, was the women's rights champion. Maybe you're not giving them the credit that they deserved and internalized misogyny actually means women, God forbid, being able to think for themselves. Another article, this is up on Breitbart, Jake Tapper triggered after GOP rep cites video of black mob attacking white Trump voter. Former GOP Congressman Jack Kingston triggered CNN's Jake Tapper Monday by pointing out Trump supporters are the only ones actually being violently attacked in the wake of the election. So he basically pointed out this video, which we featured, which went absolutely viral, of the mob in Chicago attacking this man because he voted for Donald Trump. They didn't even know it at the time, but it turns out he did. And again, Kingston, this congressman, pointed out the race of the assailants because, again, the whole narrative is about, oh, these horrible white people voted Donald Trump into power. So then they bring up this fake narrative of the supposed hate crime wave being carried out by Donald Trump supporters against minorities. Congressman Kingston gets up there and says, well, look, all the examples that I've seen are Trump voters being the victims of hate crimes. And in this case, Obviously, it was racially motivated. But Tapper can't even stand that. He says, why does it matter the race of the people that beat him up? Kingston responds, because that's what the topic is here. Just to quote, and he's quoting them. Xenophobia, homophobia, racist and sexist. That's what we talked about in the last hour. So again, it's okay to repeat over and over again that whites are responsible for voting in Trump, but merely to mention the race of a mob of thugs involved in an actual hate crime, that's despicable. Tapper, Jake Tapper was more offended by the congressman mentioning the race of this mob of thugs than he was the actual hate crime. And again, that gets to the heart of this narrative that we're hearing in the aftermath of the election. Case after case, we feature them every single day. Trump supporters being viciously attacked and abused, the victims of politically motivated, in some cases racially motivated, hate crimes. Meanwhile, Leslie Stahl gets up on CBS and says to Trump, oh, what about all these horrible attacks by your supporters against Muslims and Latinos, which are not actually happening. In fact, there was a supposed hate crime against a Muslim where her hijab got pulled. She was verbally abused by Trump supporters. The police investigated it, and she had to admit that she made it all up. Because again, the left specializes in inventing fake hate crimes against itself while carrying out actual hate crimes against other people. And now you've got them wearing safety pins as a sign of, you know, expressing their fear that minorities are going to be attacked. Again, we saw the same BS after Brexit. It was completely contrived.
and all the real threats are coming from leftists and anti-Trump people. And I'll give you another couple of examples. My goal is to assassinate Trump. That's a quote. Ohio man is first to be charged for sending threatening election night tweet. This is out of the Daily Mail. 24-year-old man from Ohio, tolerant leftist, has been charged in federal court after tweeting a threat to assassinate President-elect Donald Trump on election night because he's a tolerant, peaceful liberal. Zachary Benson from Cleveland posted the remark on Twitter a few minutes before the Republican nominee was declared the winner of last week's election. He was getting in his retaliation ahead of time. Benson tweeted, my life goal is to assassinate Trump. But again, it's Trump supporters who are hateful and violent. Let's just keep repeating that mantra. He went on to say, don't care if I serve infinite sentences, that man deserves to decease existing. So he can't even spell or type, but as you would expect. Seconds later, he tweeted, diplomacy effing fools. I hate you all. I want to bomb every one of your voting booths and your general areas. <laughs> but again, it's Trump supporters who are hateful and violent. He was interviewed by the Secret Service. He was arrested. Which is interesting because these celebrities that make the same threats aren't being arrested. You had Paul Schrader, the big film director, openly call for violence to stop Donald Trump. Not just in a roundabout way. He, he said, I want to incite violence. Let's have violence. Again, nothing happens to him. A meanly mouthed apology removed the original post. And he's probably going to get away with it. There you see the article we had up on InfoWars yesterday. Here's another one. We've been following this story. This is out of The Hill. Tech CEO resigns after death threats to Trump. The CEO of San Diego-based technology company reportedly resigned Tuesday after death threats he made against President-elect Donald Trump went viral. Wonder why they went viral. Wasn't because that article was up on Infowars.com as well, was it? Packet slides Matt Harrigan posted multiple threats against Trump on Facebook, which later went viral according to a report in the Daily Beast. Quote, I'm going to kill the president-elect, bring it secret service. And of course, we featured another tweet in which he said, yeah, I've got a sniper rival rifle, I'm positioning myself, I'm going to kill the president-elect. But again, it's Trump supporters who are hateful, it's Trump supporters who are carrying out violent hate crimes against leftists, according to CBS, according to the debunked, rigged, discredited mainstream media. Report anti-Trump protesters block ambulance father of four-year-old girl dies. We talked about that briefly earlier. Again, these are the tolerant liberals blocking ambulances, engaging in death threats, beating Trump voters to a pulp. The list goes on and on. But don't worry, because they're all wearing safety pins to show their support for the vulnerable and to express the fear that Trump supporters may physically or emotionally abuse minorities, immigrants, women, and members of the LGBT community. While all the members of those communities who are Trump supporters, they're demeaned, they're called trash. You know, rape Melania signs are held up at anti-Trump protests. They're being beaten to a pulp, according to the mainstream media. None of that even exists. Sweden the liberal basket case that we talk about every week at this point. This is out of the independent Swedish women to get hotline to report mansplaining. Oh, really? So they've got migrants raping women at music festivals every summer now. They've got people within the actual government on the immigration board posting their support for ISIS on Facebook. They've got 75% plus of rapes being carried out by immigrants. They've got murder rates skyrocketing through the roof. And what's their solution? It's to give women in the workplace a telephone hotline if they're offended about mansplaining. Okay? This is what America narrowly avoided last week. This is the direction that they avoided going in. Women who have things mansplained to them in the workplace can now report it to a dedicated hotline. In other words, men who have the temerity to have an opinion, which may differ, from triggly puff fat feminists. They've got a hotline now if they get offended. Union, Sweden's largest union, is encouraging members to call up when male colleagues give them unsolicited lectures on things that they already understand. So again, any kind of knowledge being imparted, any kind of opinion, we can't have that 
call the hotline, report the hate criminal while they're being raped at music festivals, but we don't really care about that. Because those men have brown skin and that's acceptable behaviour. This was one of the comments on the Independent article. Cool. How soon can we get a nagging hotline established? This is a very serious drain on men's productivity, and I bet the incidents of nagging are probably 10 to 1 compared to mansplaining, which isn't even a real thing. So Sweden is dealing with the fact that 80%, 75% of its uh, rapes now are committed by migrants by importing more migrants and giving women a telephone hotline to complain if they're offended about a man in the workplace having an opinion. And that's why Sweden, as a country, is dying. Okay, moving on. Twitter finally answers critics adding tools to curb abuse and harassment. This is out of Bloomberg. Basically, what's happened, Twitter has added a word filter where permanently outraged morons can filter out words that trigger them, that cause them to retreat to their safe spaces by typing them in to their settings. Now, I guess for social justice warriors, that list of banned words that trigger them will include fact and logic. But again, this is how Twitter is dealing with harassment. They've also introduced another policy, which is here in this article. For anyone who spots language that violates the company's policy, there's a new option to report hateful conduct in addition to abuse and harassment. Hateful conduct meaning anyone who has a different opinion. Milo got banned for criticizing a Ghostbusters movie. Again, people have been banned for retweeting or responding to or disagreeing with a Trigglypuff. They think disagreeing with them, they think retweeting them is harassment and the Trust and Safety Council are now going to cater for them as Twitter continues to collapse. Their stock continues to dive. They continue to go the way of MySpace. The verified notifications are broken. That hasn't been fixed. Nobody cares. Twitter's basically dying. It's going to be gone in a few years. And if that's their policy, then bon voyage. Report majority arrested in Portland anti-Trump protests didn't vote. What a surprise. More than 50% of the anti-Trump protesters arrested in Portland, Oregon in the days following the election did not bother to vote. They're all out on the street harassing pregnant women, blocking ambulances, having mass hissy fits because their candidate didn't win the election. Turns out more than 50% of them arrested in Portland didn't even bother to get out of their parents' basements to vote in the first place. We'll be back with the final segment. Stay tuned. Barack Obama is out basically trashing nationalism, saying that it's going to lead to another world war. Well, actually, that's what the election of Hillary Clinton would have led to. Thankfully, we've averted that. But again, failing to grasp the very fact why Donald Trump won, because he dared to say he wanted to put America first. And if they continue to not grasp that fact as to why they're continually losing, then all the better for us. Let's get into a few final news stories here. Now, let's get into this poll that came out. This is in the article, which is up on InfoWars. Desperate establishment media says everything apart from itself is fake. And of course, this is in relation to Google and Facebook cracking down on fake news, which if they really cracked down on fake news, the mainstream media wouldn't be on there at all. Of course, fake news is a problem. It's the problem that I decry on a regular basis. People just make up complete crap. And it's obvious to see that it's crap from first glance to make advertising dollars. But again, what they're doing. They're rolling this all in and saying that Breitbart Infowars is all part of this fake news output. When in fact, yes, we publish hundreds of stories a day. Occasionally we're going to get something wrong, but we don't willingly try to put out fake news, which is what fake news websites do. They know it's fake news when they publish it. They publish it for that reason, because it's shocking, because it's completely made up. There's a difference between fake news and having a different opinion, okay? There's a difference between not being CNN, for example, which has interviews with its own cameramen pretending that they're anti-Trump protesters. OK, that's rigged media. The rigged media was basically expo exposed as being fake news in the WikiLeaks revelations. But this poll is in the article. A new YouGov poll finds that seven in 10, 69 percent of voters do not believe the news media are honest and truthful. The poll also finds that 8 in 10 of voters 
believe the corporate news coverage of the presidential campaign was biased, with a nearly three to one majority believing the media were for Clinton versus the ones that were for Trump. So again, more polls showing that the bias rigged mainstream media is not trusted by the American people. Surprise, surprise, given that they're coming out with this narrative now that it's Trump supporters that are engaging in hateful, violent hate crimes when the reality is the complete opposite. And in fact, I've got a video coming out on YouTube in about 15 minutes from now. It's called Morons React to Trump Winning. And it's basically six minutes, wall to wall, hateful, violent tweets, Facebook posts by leftists threatening to kill people who support Trump, threatening to kill Trump himself. And again, engaging in absolute total idiocy. Many, much of it hateful. Much of it could be described as a hate crime if that, those behaviors, those actions are actually carried out. So that video is coming out soon on YouTube. It will be up on Infowars.com. Another article up on Infowars.com today. Report Hillary became physically violent after she realized she lost the election. Now, we knew she was violent. We knew she engaged in rageful temper tantrums for years and years. Every single Secret Service member who's gone on the record about this says the same thing, that people would literally duck into side doors when she was walking down a corridor because she would just have a massive hissy fit anytime she saw anyone. Her own campaign last year in October said that she was going to have a meltdown because she was having so many rages. And again, we're seeing more of these I like this term, Hillary in the bunker stories. There was one about how she was completely drunk on election night. Now, this one, according to Todd Kincannon, who spoke to a CNN reporter, who told him that Hillary became physically violent towards Robbie Mook and John Podesta, her campaign staffers around midnight, had to be briefly restrained. So again, another report about Hillary Clinton having a rage fit, that she was drunk on election night. And of course, that could have been why she didn't appear to give the concession speech that night. We only saw her the next day. That's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Alex Jones Show. InfoWars Nightly News is coming up tonight. Alex will be back 11 to 2 tomorrow. Breaking news at InfoWars.com.